Last year, I wrote and published my script for a sequel to Arkham Origins, which I titled Batman Arkham Bonds. It's the story of Dick Grayson's first trials as Robin, Batman coming to terms with having a family again, and a clash between the old criminals of Gotham and the new breed of supervillains. It's something that I'm really proud of, and it seems like other people enjoyed it, because ever since I've been getting requests for a sequel to my imaginary sequel. So here it is. One more massive display of narcissism. This is a story I've had in the back of my head for well over a year now, but it took me a long time to get it just right. And by just right, I mean definitely not perfect, which will become obvious to you throughout this video, but I'm pretty happy with it, and I think it serves not only as a proper sequel to Arkham Bonds, but also wraps up some loose threads left in Origins, and serves the larger story of the Arkham series. At least, I hope it does. So let's get the usual caveats out of the way before diving into this way too long video. The only canon I'm paying attention to are the actual real world 5 Arkham games, as well as the events established in Arkham Bonds. Any outside media doesn't matter to me. I also have zero knowledge of video game development, from design to writing to whatever else I don't know. However, this isn't a script for a movie or a show. It's a video game, and I make a conscious effort to describe every action in that context and provide details for how I envision gameplay. Sometimes I'll get very in the weeds, other times I'll leave it up to your imagination. My hope is that I'm able to paint a rough enough picture and you're familiar enough with the Arkham franchise that you can fill in the gaps. With that said, it's going to be impossible for me to line up like 99% of what I'm discussing with any visuals on screen. I'll try my best, but for the most part you're just going to be looking at random gameplay. I apologize, but this game simply does not exist. Now let's set the stage. Batman Arkham Origins 3, or as I've taken to calling it, Batman Arkham Unleashed, is set halfway through Batman's sixth year of crime fighting. Parts of the story are heavily influenced by Nightfall, Batman and Robin Eternal, and Batgirl Year One. While the influence may be less obvious, the entire run of Batman and Detective Comics from 1986 to 1993 were a big part of my research prior to writing this script particularly the works of Alan Grant and Norm Brayfogle. Honestly, I highly recommend reading everything from this period. Even the bad stuff is pretty fun. Anyway, it's been two and a half years since Arkham Bonds. Batman and Robin are well established by this point. Batman has spent more time on his crusade with Robin than without him. However, Dick isn't the kid he was in the last game. He's grown into a young man, and his first semester of college is beginning soon. After her experience assisting Batman's operations as Oracle, Barbara Gordon felt she could do more and took to the streets as Batgirl, at first without Bruce's permission. Eventually, he took her under his wing, and she's been an official member of the Bat family for about six months. Dick and Babs have also been dating for like a year or so. A little bit about Gotham City at large, Gordon has finally been made commissioner of police, the old crime organizations have become irrelevant, and supervillains are a constant in Gotham City. Arkham Asylum is finally up and running under the stewardship of Quincy Sharp. Things are starting to look a lot more like the Gotham we were introduced to in Arkham Asylum. One final thing before getting started, I'm going to be breaking two major Arkham franchise traditions just like I did with the last game. The game will not take place over one night, and the Joker won't be a primary antagonist. Although, he has a role to play. With all that said, let the game begin. An elevator opens with a shriek of bats. Bruce Wayne walks out and marches into the bat cave, emerging into a bath of light and laughter. The underground headquarters has grown drastically, brightly lit and filled with trophies collected over the years. Dick Grayson sits with his feet up watching TV and sipping Alfred's famous cocoa while the trusty butler pesters him about the quality of the program. Training off to the side, Barbara Gordon chimes in that Alfred seems to know far too much about the trash reality TV he purports to despise. Bruce steps into the light, smiling. He's done it. He's rebuilt a family. Ace the Bat Hound barks and rushes over to him. The others look back at Bruce. It's time to suit up. Cut to black. In the darkness, the sound of flapping builds to a raucous chorus. Light bursts forth onto the screen. 
The sound of applause is for Bruce Wayne, who adjusts his tuxedo's bow tie as he walks out onto a stage where he's the guest of honor hosting a charity auction. A banner for the Martha Wayne Memorial Children's Hospital hangs in the background. Bruce doesn't miss a beat, hamming it up as an airheaded playboy beside his fellow host, Vicky Vale. As the applause simmers down, Vicky shifts attention to tonight's cause, childhood poverty. Bruce joins her in emphasizing the seriousness, admitting that he can't relate to the full experience of these children, but many are orphans, chewed up and spit out by a broken system, terrified and alone. He can relate to that. He wants to do everything in his power to make sure they have a roof over their heads and can feel safe at night. Which is why an entire wing of this soon-to-be-opened hospital will be dedicated to housing and treating the impoverished children of Gotham at no cost. He hates to admit it, but everyone here was invited for their deep pockets, not their good looks. This gets a little chuckle from the audience, and right as the auction is about to get going, the auditorium doors are kicked in. The Misfits, Catman, Chancer, and Killer Moth have arrived. Catman and Chancer are on crowd control, forcing everybody to fork over their money, while Killer Moth charges the main stage to take Bruce Wayne hostage, who begins really hamming it up in fear, suggesting the criminals take the beautiful Vicky Vale instead. As this chaos unfolds, the camera pans out to a bird's eye view of the auditorium. The player is prompted to press X to stop the chaos. That's when Batgirl shoots out of the ceiling, landing on Catman. Chancer spins around, threatening to use his baton of luck when the player is prompted to press X again. This time, Robin fires out of a nearby grate, backflipping onto Chancer, incapacitating him and snatching his baton of luck out of the air, tossing it at Killer Moth, who shoots it down with his cocoon gun. The villain freaks out. Damning the brat's interference, he uses Bruce as a meat shield and tells the heroes to back off. He's walking out of here with the pretty boy. Bruce begs Batgirl and Robin not to let him do it, offering them money to stop this lunatic. Robin asks how much. Batgirl tells Killer Moth he can't escape, but he tries anyway, fleeing out the back with Bruce Wayne in tow. As Batgirl, the player races after them, while Robin stays behind to clean up the mess. Outside, they spot Killer Moth's getaway car, the Mothmobile, which peels out. Alfred chimes in over comms, wondering how the operation is going. Batgirl hops on her bat cycle and gives chase, telling him Bruce's performance was quite convincing. Alfred responds that he taught Master Bruce everything he knows about the theater. As the player pursues Killer Moth, they get a quick tutorial for controlling the bat cycle as they dodge incoming fire from an automated turret atop the Mothmobile, which is of course firing out sticky cocoon blasts. If they hit, they slow the cycle down temporarily. All the while, Bruce and Killer Moth's conversation is audible due to Bruce's earpiece. It's a comedic back and forth with Killer Moth anxious about the chase, and Bruce aloof and bumbling. Once the player gets close enough, they'll initiate Batgirl to vault onto the roof of the Mothmobile and disable the turret. The player then rolls down the windshield and starts pounding on the glass. Killer Moth fires a blast from his cocoon gun through the windshield, which the player has to dodge, flipping Batgirl out of the way, redirecting her momentum to crash through the driver's side window, kicking Killer Moth across the face, which sends his helmet spinning, and firing across Bruce Wayne, who artfully reclines just in time to allow Batgirl to fly out the passenger window unimpeded. From the sidewalk, the player watches the Mothmobile careen off-road, rolling over several times. The player runs to the wreckage where they find Bruce climbing out of the shattered windshield, unharmed. But Killer Moth managed to abandon the vehicle. She spots him several meters down the road just as he begins to soar away. Up above, his moth copter carries him by harness into the sky. The player throws a battering, severing the harness and bringing Killer Moth crashing to the ground, knocking him out. Bruce walks up behind Batgirl and whispers that he's called the car for her, just as the GCPD and reporters circle the scene. The citizens of Gotham surround them, Batgirl lugs Killer Moth over her shoulder, and Bruce slips back into character, profusely thanking Batgirl and offering to take her out on a world-class date. The Batmobile pulls up and Batgirl is bombarded with questions as she packs Killer Moth into the back of the vehicle. The words, Commissioner coming, clear the way, are her sign to get moving. The player hops inside the Batmobile where Robin is already waiting in the passenger seat. You weren't planning on driving out to the country without me, were you? The player is prompted to drive to Arkham Asylum to drop off Killer Moth, which gives them plenty of time to take in the sights of the open world. It's not available to free roam in just yet, but that's coming soon. For now, take in the gothic, modern, 1940s, art deco, neon collage of this beautiful, 
cursed city. Since I have no responsibilities for budget, I say the world this time around includes the maps of all five previous games. Origins, Bonds, Asylum, City, and Night, as well as two additional sections of Gotham that are more coastal, although they still have a natural border of a large river, which serves as a border for the map. Also, of course the sections from previous games look different, the Night Islands are more in a renovation phase, and Asylum… well, we're on our way to the Asylum. On the drive, Batgirl and Robin get to talking. Another feature of this game is that when traversing in the open world with a partnered AI character, both characters will have in-game dialogue that informs their worldview at that moment, and the relationship between the different characters. A conversation between Batgirl and Robin will be very different than one between her and Batman. Anyway, Batgirl is happy with her takedown of Killer Moth. She's not exactly new at this, but taking down supervillains hasn't lost its novelty. Although, Robin is something else on his mind. His college orientation is tomorrow. Batgirl says she nearly forgot, and asks if he's still looking forward to it. The two go back and forth a bit, but the gist of it is that Robin… doesn't know how to feel. He's excited to go off on his own, but things with Bruce feel weird. He practically refuses to talk about Dick leaving. They haven't even discussed what happens to Robin after he moves out. Once the player gets to the outskirts of the city, Robin says he's going to circle back to the auction venue now that the mob has had time to clear out and see if he can learn anything more about the gang of misfits. He leaps out of the vehicle while the player continues to drive through the iconic Arkham Asylum entrance. However, this is a very different asylum than fans are familiar with. This is a proto-asylum only recently reopened within the last couple years. The technology is fairly primitive, the Wayne Tech security systems are not present. The only operational buildings that the player would recognize are Arkham Manor, the Botanical Gardens, and Intensive Treatment, which isn't even called that yet, it's just the Psychiatric Ward. Then there are the two buildings in Arkham North that are ruins by the time of Asylum, which are a gothic chapel and housing dormitory for guards. The player parks the Batmobile outside the psych ward, and a brief cutscene begins. An interior shot shows the doors to the psych ward being opened by two security guards, revealing Batgirl and Killer Moth. You lost one, Batgirl says, passing the villain over to the guards. She wants to investigate his cell to see how he escaped, but the guards get real fidgety. They tell her she isn't allowed inside. Batgirl retorts that Killer Moth wasn't allowed outside, and she's gonna find out how he got out. The guards become crazed, striking at Batgirl, which the player is prompted to counter, leading into a small fight where the player has to take down these guards, as well as a handcuffed Killer Moth who is trying to take advantage of the situation. There's something weird going on at the asylum, Batgirl says into her communicator. Guards just attacked me. They didn't seem in their right minds. Don't do anything reckless, Batman answers. I'll be there within minutes. Batgirl pushes through doors into the next section of the psych ward to find a dozen guards and doctors heading straight for her with melee weapons. Reckless? Me? From here, the player fights their way through the psychiatric ward. There's some combat to do and some stealth to be had. I won't get too in the weeds on level design and minute to minute gameplay, but the overall experience is a familiar one, revisiting a familiar setting but with a new coat of paint playing as a different character, and fighting guards rather than inmates. All the while, Batgirl is trying to figure out what's wrong with these guys. They seem to be under some kind of spell. Could it be Mad Hatter? But don't they all need to be wearing… hats? Could it be genuine magic like that Zatanna chick? Then she comes upon the problem. Good old Poison Ivy is caught kissing a guard with a couple loyal puppets already at her side. They enter through a checkpoint for the maximum security wing, then shut and lock it from the inside. Poison Ivy turns to face Batgirl. She says she's flattered by Batgirl's interest, but unfortunately she already has more suitors than she knows what to do with. She commands her squad of mind-controlled doctors and guards to protect their precious Ivy, and the player engages in some goon punching. During the fight, Batgirl tells Ivy she should have taken the opportunity to leave town after her recent escape from Blackgate. Ivy retorts that she's on the brink of making permanent change in Gotham, a real difference for the betterment of the Earth. Batman will die if he tries to stop her. Batgirl, on the other hand, I can have fun with you. When the goon battle ends, Ivy raises her arms and plants erupt from the walls, striking at Batgirl and flinging her into the previous room. 
This will be the boss fight arena. Batgirl asks what she's doing here. Ivy says she's given Gotham what it deserves, as spiked vines wrap around her arms and legs. She says the bats claim to serve justice, but are too pig-headed to see the bigger picture. Ivy shoots the vines across the room, but Batgirl rolls out of the way. The boss fight begins. The player needs to dodge Poison Ivy strikes and slice the vines with well-timed batarangs. If the vines make contact, not only does Batgirl take damage, but the poison lingers, slowly eating away at her health bar. The more hits taken, the faster the poison spreads. Once the player manages to sever all four vine limbs, Batgirl moves in for a critical strike on Ivy. After the process of delivering two critical strikes, Ivy releases a small cloud of pheromones onto Batgirl. The world turns a bright pink. A hallucinogenic filter morphs things ever so slightly. Ivy's voice sounds kinder, more alluring. This is just a taste of the paradise I can make this world if you just give in. And it would make me so happy to give you this world. You want to make me happy, don't you? While in this distorted world, the player is still fighting to deliver the third critical strike. However, when the player initiates it, Batgirl stops herself. Sweet girl, the shadows have kept you from the sun. Let me give you the chance to see another day. Poison Ivy goes in for a kiss, but screams in agony. Batgirl has jammed a severed electric wire from the torn up battlefield into Ivy's stomach, loosening her grip over Batgirl so she can strike, immobilizing Ivy. Overwhelmed and fried, Ivy tells the hero she's already too late. Tomorrow, the decay of Gotham will be burned away, making fertile soil for her new world. She is pulled to safety by her weeds, carried out the exit she created in the destroyed wall, which brings a portion of the ceiling crumbling down, blocking Batgirl's path. Unable to proceed further into the psych ward, she calls Batman and tells him that this was Ivy's handiwork. She got away, but has something planned for the maximum security wing. I'm here. The camera zooms out from Batgirl to Batman, dive bombing out of the Batwing down toward the Arkham grounds, giving the player a bird's eye view of the island. Once Batman lands, a contingent of guards charge out of the housing building, so the player gets to pounding some asses. I'd like to point out that the Batsuit in this game is more in line with the blue and grey color scheme than his other suits in the series. I'd like to think that most of Batman continuity can fit within the Arkhamverse, which means he went through his blue period at least briefly, and the most logical time would have been during the Dick Grayson Robin years. The coloring doesn't need to be as stark as it was in the comics, but I think a subdued blue with the yellow oval on the chest are a must-have and would look sick. So as that ass whooping is going down, Batgirl chimes in saying she's circling back to the security room to get the systems under control. Once the asses have been properly whooped, the player needs to find another way into maximum security since the interior path was cut off by Ivy. Batman knows of a story from back when Amadeus Arkham ran the asylum, Dead Man's Point, where the inmates would escape to commit suicide. If they found a way out, he can find a way in. The player needs to do a little exploring and environmental puzzle solving, which eventually leads them to a small cave off to the side of the psych ward, familiar enough to fans of the first game, where Batman is able to spelunk around and break into a ventilation shaft, spilling out into the middle of a maximum security cell block that is teeming with hordes of loose inmates fighting each other as they try to make a run for it without any guards to stop them. You thought ass kicking time was over? Silly player. It's only just begun. Batman lunges into the action, however this time around some of the inmates are armed with assault rifles. Once that's been taken care of, the alarms go quiet. I've got control, Batgirl announces. Check Joker's cell. He's there, thank god. The others? I see Nigma, Harvey, oh no. Bane is missing. Cyanus is just being led out by… wait, who is this? I'm going after them. The player is prompted to keep moving deeper into the asylum. Damn it, Batgirl shouts. All cameras just went down. I didn't recognize the one letting them out. Heavily armored, white cape, purple helmet? Batman tells her that the inmates he stopped had access to weaponry not easily accessible on the grounds. Someone is arming them. It must be that man. Just then, the player hits a dead end, the checkpoint outside the intensive treatment section of maximum security where all the baddest of the bad are held, has been locked down. Batgirl tells him that this mystery man is doing a hell of a job slowing them down, she'll need to manually override the system, which will take some time. That's when more Arkham guards come pouring out and the player must last two minutes as wave after wave attack. 
After that, the guards begin coming to their senses. Batman suspects that Poison Ivy has made it off Arkham Island, the strength of her control is dependent on her proximity to her victims. He tells the guards to look after those who have been injured, and to help secure what's left of the building. Batgirl is finally able to open the door behind him, and Batman marches through. An explosion rocks the building as the player rounds the corner, passing empty cell after empty cell of Batman's most deranged rogues until they come upon the source of the explosion. Joker's empty cell. The back wall has been blown apart, connecting to an old sewer system, which leads the player down a decayed and foul path, trudging through murky catacombs that have not been touched in decades. Finally, Batman spots his prey. On the far side of a tunnel, the group of escaped supervillains manage to push down a rusted shut door. It's a who's who of Arkham escapees. Everyone you can imagine has been freed. Scarecrow, Zazz, Ventriloquist, Riddler, Firefly, Mr. Freeze, Black Mask, Ratcatcher, Calendar Man, Crazy Quilt, and more, including Bane, who has a chained up Joker lugged over his shoulder, cackling to himself. The group exits the tunnel and the player chases after them, inadvertently getting a tour through the depths of the twisting cave system beneath Arkham Island which Batman is seeing for the first time. The player manages to catch up to the villains in a massive cavern and tells them there's no way out, they aren't going anywhere. An explosion from behind caves in the path they entered from. Out of the shadows behind Batman emerges an armored man with a white cape, yellow gauntlets, and a purple helmet. He whips a large nightstick, aiming to crack the back of Batman's skull, but he blocks it at the last instant with his forearm. The baton crackles with electricity, and Batman darts backward. Let's play cops and robbers, the mystery man says. You chase, they run. The Joker's cackle echoes throughout the cavern as the horde of villains disappear down another cave. So, you've seen the thumbnail, you know what's up. It's Prometheus. We're doing Prometheus. He steps between Batman and his rogues, which means it's time for a boss battle. The player engages Prometheus in hand-to-hand -hand combat, needing to counter or evade his various gadgets, like an electric nightstick and darts fired from his wrist gauntlets, making him a challenge in close quarters and ranged combat. Here's a good time to reiterate that I'm a no-game designer, but I think it's no fun for you if I don't provide at least a rough idea of how gameplay situations, especially boss encounters, play out, because there should always be a fair deal of storytelling done through gameplay. So my rough idea for this fight is that each time Batman knocks Prometheus' health down by a third, Prometheus will retreat to a corner and, over-exaggeratedly, prepare to hurl a large amount of explosives at Batman. The player needs to batarang the explosives out of his hand, which Prometheus will then roll away from before they explode. Then it's back to fisticuffs. After three explosions, the boss battle ends with the cave shaking and Prometheus smirking. He's insulted that Batman thought he was so careless. Rubble begins tumbling down between them. The ground starts to crack. Batman realizes the explosives were purposely set off at specific locations, and the floor gives out beneath him. He plummets down with the rubble toward the rough waters below, but the player manages to grapple up to safety. However, Prometheus is gone. Then the player follows after the villains, eventually stepping out onto a familiar cliff face overlooking the water, only to watch a helicopter soaring away in the distance. Batman starts typing coordinates into his gauntlet. Batman, are you there? Batgirl asks over the communicator. Maximum security is empty. They're gone. They're all gone. The Batwing soars up to the ledge, stopping on a dime. Batman climbs across the wing and steps inside. We'll get them back. All of them and the ones responsible. The Batwing blasts away, fire fills the screen, the words, Batman Arkham Unleashed Simmer, before fading into darkness. Fade in on Robin. He's managed to pick up the trail of Killer Moth's escape helicopter, following it to a warehouse in the Coventry district. Outside, he touches base with the team on comms. Batgirl says she's speaking with Detective Bullock now, Batman is already in the city, trying to head off the coming chaos. So the player proceeds into this warehouse, which turns out to be the hidden location of the Moth Cave. Yep, that's right. Imagine a low-rent ripoff with moth-themed paraphernalia littered about, as well as some moth-themed goons inside. Robin's goal is to figure out how Killer Moth escaped Arkham Asylum before the larger jailbreak. 
the player needs to sneak inside and access the Moth computer, taking out all the goons stealthily before they get the chance to delete any incriminating information. All the while, we get some classic Arkham goon dialogue, with the thugs discussing next steps without their boss around, as well as complaining about the silly outfits he makes them wear. Once all the goons are taken down, Robin does his thing with the computer and sees that only days ago, Killer Moth came into a great deal of funds from an organization called Marchenko Inc. Robin downloads the information and catches a reflection in the computer screen. Turning around, he sees a leg disappearing through an open window. He snags the USB and the player is prompted to pursue this spy outside to the rooftops, where they spot a ninja clad in all black, hightailing it out of there. Don't suppose you're bird watching, Robin asks, as the player begins their pursuit across the Gotham skyline. The chase is spiced up with some ninja tricks that have the player busting out some fancy maneuvers to dodge. Remember, Robin has his handy double jump ability until the player manages to catch up. With nowhere left to run, the ninja reveals herself to be Lady Shiva, who Robin recognizes from Batman's files. She didn't want to contend with a student of the Bat so soon, but it will be no matter to defeat this boy. The boss fight begins. There are two stages to this boss fight, one that takes place on a rooftop, and the second stage that takes place inside a rundown tenement home, after they've crashed through a window. The combat is close quarters, with the occasional ninja gadget flying around. Once inside, the player can take advantage of interactive objects in the environment to do some serious damage. All the while, Robin is questioning why the League of Assassins is in Gotham. Did Shiva break Killer Moth out? Was the League responsible for the Arkham breakout? Or was she just spying on him? When the player defeats Lady Shiva inside the tenement, she is stunned that Robin managed to overcome her. At his mercy, Robin demands answers, but the room floods with smoke. A shadow strikes out, pinning Robin to the ground. Talia Al Ghul is revealed through the clearing smoke, wielding a scimitar. Her boot is pressed against Robin's chest. She declares that if the great Raish al Ghul had anything to do with Gotham's madhouse, it would be the slaughter of those who call it home. No, they are in Gotham for a purpose Robin's master should approve of, the tracking of a criminal. Robin asks if she means the freak in the medieval helmet. Lady Shiva tells him to watch his tongue when speaking to the daughter of the demon. Talia smirks and says that Prometheus has shown his hand. It was he who released your Mothman early, likely as bait. Talia releases Robin, who leaps up asking what she knows, but once again, smoke fills the room, and Robin is left on his own with more questions than answers. Following this, the player is transported back in control of Batman on the other side of town, free to engage in some open world side activities. Once enough time has passed, suddenly, there's a crackle across every TV in Gotham. And we're live! This is live, right? Yes, Mr. Riddler. That's right, good old Eddie Enigma pops up yet again. He backs away from the camera, revealing he's on the set of a talk show with a string of dynamite wrapped around his waist. He plops down on the guest couch beside a clearly terrified Jack Ryder. Now this is how you get someone's attention. You'll get a bump in the ratings for sure, Ryder. Welp, why waste any more time? Riddle me this. Never seen and seldom heard, I'm shared in private dwellings, and my power is in telling. What am I? Alfred calls in, providing the location of the Jack Ryder show set, which the player is prompted to head toward. By the time they arrive, a police perimeter has been set up. Batman walks up to Commissioner Gordon and Rene Montoya. Both officers shake his hand, then Robin drops down next to them, sending Montoya flinching back. Now that the dynamic duo have arrived, let's get started. Gordon says. That madman has taken an entire studio audience hostage, not to mention that clown riders right next to him. I can't risk sending any of my men in there. You won't need to, Batman says. Riddler's vain, but he isn't this brash. There's a reason he's doing this. He wants to talk. That's what this entire show is for. Gordon wishes the heroes luck, and the player can swap between Batman and Robin throughout most of the level. As they head inside, Batman tells Robin to be careful. Riddler may want them here, but that doesn't mean he's going to make it easy. There's always a test with him. Robin asks for a spoiler. He wants Batman to tell him the answer to the riddle. It's a secret, Batman says. So this mission consists of working up three levels to Jack Ryder's set. The first two levels of the building have been set with a series of brain teasers and puzzles that need solving to reach the end. 
They need to be done without being detected by one of Riddler's main henchwomen, Floor 1 belongs to Quiz, and Floor 2 belongs to Query. Each of them needs to be stealthily knocked out before the player can move up. All the while, Riddler's big break plays out across TVs for the player to listen in on. He has cameras rigged up on these floors, and is televising video of Batman and Robin's gauntlet to all of Gotham City with Jack Ryder's forced color commentary. During these levels, Robin takes the time to tell Batman about his run-in with the League of Assassins, and provides the name Prometheus. Batman is concerned about the League's involvement, particularly this daughter of Ra's al Ghul, and asks Alfred to look into the mysterious Marchenko Inc. Once Query is defeated, the player makes their way up to the third floor and arrives at the Jack Ryder Show set, which is swarming with more Riddler goons that the player needs to take down discreetly while Riddler toys with Jack Ryder, who he thinks is a complete moron, and the studio audience. Everyone is forced to take turns guessing the answer as Riddler belittles them. Ryder tries hamming it up for the camera, still trying to make the most of his situation for his career. Once all the goons are down, Batman and Robin sneak up on an unsuspecting Riddler, too focused on asserting his superiority over Ryder to realize the situation he's in. Robin quietly clears Ryder out of the way, so the player, as Batman, can execute an inverted takedown on Riddler, dropping behind him, breaking the hand holding the dynamite detonator, then zipping back up to the vantage point. What's your secret? Batman dangles Riddler by his broken hand. You brute! You shattered my fingers! This is how you repay a favor? Too stupid to realize the dynamite was fake? I'm not here to play games. Through gritted teeth, Riddler explains that he wants to help Batman. This was the best way to get his attention in the chaos of the night. Batman presses him about Prometheus. Riddler says he hasn't been making a lot of noise in the underground, but there have been some rumblings. Batman asks who he is, but Riddler doesn't know much other than he's an idiot. The jailbreak was so embarrassingly sloppy, we're all bound to get caught. If I hadn't acted my own escape plan, well then, things would be much different for you, Dark Knight detective. But as it stands, all us escapees are screwed. I have no interest in being a pawn in someone else's game." So, the Riddler is hoping to use this as a chance to earn some better conditions upon his fateful return to the asylum. Batman drops him, sending him crashing onto the guest couch and bouncing onto the floor. By this point, the audience has fled and the police are securing the area. They cuff Riddler, who pleads his case. As a show of good faith, he's going willingly and leaving Batman with a hot tip. Of course, in the form of a riddle. Feared by the living and home to the dead, my waters are shallow but filled with dread. What am I? Montoya shoves Riddler forward. Batman tells Gordon they should set Nigma up in the protective custody lockup in the GCPD HQ. Gordon says that if word gets out about preferential treatment for the Riddler, it isn't going to look good to the mayor. He trusts Batman, but he warns him that the higher-ups are already exerting a lot of influence because of the jailbreak. Once outside, Batman and Robin split off. It's time for some open-world free roam activities. I also want to take this time to say that I won't be going into any side missions in this video. However, I do want to point out that starting from here, the Riddler acts as a sort of side quest giver. Through his network of informants, led by Quiz and Query during his incarceration, the Riddler is able to gather intel on certain supervillain crimes, which he provides only after the player has solved a certain amount of his open world riddles. I don't have the specifics mapped out yet, and not every side mission will be provided by him, but please let me know if you'd like to hear more about ideas for side missions. I thought this was a good time to bring these up, because engaging with side missions adds to the sense of chaos that Gotham is experiencing, which may not be obvious when discussing just the main campaign. Although the side missions are optional, between some missions the player will be forced to interact with at least some of them before moving on. So as we proceed, if you begin to wonder what happened to all the villains who escaped Arkham, Keep in mind that the majority of them, at least those not involved in the main plot, are up to all kinds of no good, just off to the side. With that said, after engaging in the open world for a bit, eventually Alfred calls Batman with more information on Marchenko Inc. Or rather, he states that he couldn't find any information other than it's owned by another organization, Gardevia Holdings. Turns out this is a parent company for several organizations that have been buying up property throughout Gotham. Batman asks if any of those properties are near Slaughter Swamp, and Alfred says that there was one piece of land purchased within the last couple years, and sends over the coordinates. 
Based on that last riddle, Batman thinks this property is the last piece of the puzzle. He believes Prometheus is hiding near Slaughter Swamp, and this helps narrow things down. So the player heads to the legendary Slaughter Swamp, located on the outskirts of Gotham City. The area is desolate and dark. If Prometheus is based out here, it would explain how he's flown under the radar this long. The player walks down a path walled off by crooked trees, stripped of any leaves despite autumn not being for a couple more months. In the distance, through the trees, Batman sees a candle flickering in the window of a cabin. Lightning flashes, and Prometheus' silhouette appears on the path before them. The player spins around, but sees nothing. They turn back and begin the trudge to the cabin, eventually wading through knee-high swamp muck. A hand reaches out from the water to grab them. The player counters, only to realize it's the severed hand of a skeleton, a soul long gone and long forgotten. Batman reflects on the old rumors about this place, said to be imbued with an ancient evil. He shrugs it off, but Amity Arkham's words creep into his mind. This city is cursed, Batman. How can you win? The cabin is closer now. Lightning strikes and Prometheus's silhouette spreads across the black water. Batman turns again, but just then, muffled screams erupt from the cabin. The player races to the front door, kicking it in. Wind chimes made of bones clatter beside them. Alone in the cabin is a grey-haired, middle-aged woman tied to a chair and gagged. There's no sign of Prometheus. Batman darts inside to untie her as she struggles. When he removes the gag, she exhales violently, then catches her breath, rubs her wrists, and thanks Batman for his arrival. He asks who did this to her, and she tells him that her children did. But they aren't to be blamed, she told them to. They're loyal to her. Batman looks around the cabin and asks who she is. I'm your mother. Batman falls to his knees, coughing. He reaches for his utility belt and injects himself in the neck with an antitoxin. Oh, pitiful child. Your counter agent for Dr. Crane won't protect you from me. It begins to rain inside the cabin. Droplets pour from the ceiling. Mother's body sways like a specter. The player is prompted to move, to escape. They turn around, but the exit is gone. I had my suspicions, and there it is written on your face. Another orphan shaped by tragedy. Mother Specter approaches the player, who is prompted to evade. Batman pulls out his explosive gel, fires it on the wall, detonates it, and rushes outside, falling into the water, falling through a spiral of darkness, falling for eternity through swirling folds of madness that suffocate the light. Until eventually, the player touches down in the void. Skeletons and rotted corpses emerge from the swirl, and the player must beat them back, or else they'll be overwhelmed. All the while, Mother speaks. Let me nurture you. Let me protect you. Set the boy free. He's imperfect. His conditioning was spoiled. It's not your fault. You did your best. But I specialize in shaping young minds. Why stop at one soldier when you can have a dozen? The skeletons and corpses shift to look like Prometheus as his voice echoes out from the waters, mocking him. Mother continues. Without my help, you will fail. Tonight was just a taste of what's to come. Your ward is too weak. The girl, merely a pretender. They aren't strong enough for you. I can give you better. I can make you stronger. All you have to do is nothing, and I can provide you with an infinite supply shaped in your image. After fighting off the last of the enemies, Robin and Batgirl's hands reach up from beneath the water and pull Batman in. The world goes black, then fades in to reveal Batman on his knees in the swamp as Mother emerges from the shadows before him. What are you after? Batman chokes out. Think about my offer. Loyalty. Obedience. Soldiers who will never leave your side. Mother kisses his forehead, sending him flailing back into the dark spiral falling once again, only to jolt awake in the Batcave. He's surrounded by Alfred, Dick, and Barbara. They all breathe a sigh of relief. Alfred says he gave them quite the scare, while Barbara smirks, knowing he wouldn't be down for long. Dick is the only one who keeps his distance. He's glad Bruce is well, but there's something eating at him. Disoriented, Bruce stumbles off a cot. Where's Mother? Mother? Alfred asks. Dick found you washed up in Slaughter Swamp. Barbara says. We found antitoxin in your bloodstream, Dick jumps in. It obviously didn't work. Who did this to you? I... How's the city? Bruce asks. 
Still standing, Alfred explains that things have quieted down and suggests they all get some much-deserved rest while it's still morning, especially Master Richard, who only has 90 minutes to sleep before departing for orientation. Dick waves that away, saying he can skip it. He's needed in Gotham now, right Bruce? Bruce has worked his way over to the back computer by this point. Without turning back, he says they could handle things in his absence. Dick goes to speak, but holds his tongue. Instead, he just says goodnight to Bruce. He kisses Barbara and asks if she wants to stay over. Alfred says absolutely not under his roof, and Dick shrugs. Alfred sighs and Barbara wishes Dick good luck. She takes off on her motorcycle as Alfred, Dick, and Ace head out of the cave. Bruce remains seated. Locked onto his computer, the screens are filled with every Arkham inmate who's escaped. When the stair lights go out, he holds his head in his hand and sighs. Fade to black. Fade in on a television in an apartment living room playing the news. Anchorwoman Vicky Vale is speaking about the Arkham breakout and how it's shaken the city. The citizens are up in arms about the handling of this incident. They're terrified, and the mayor is under serious fire. The only ones outside after dark tonight are the police, the politically motivated, or members of the underworld. Just then, a shadow blows past the window. Cut to another TV in another apartment. The news program continues as Vicky plays a press conference given earlier that day by Arkham Asylum's warden, Quincy Sharp, who blames the mayor for the breakout, claiming he denied the asylum additional security funding which Sharp had requested. Another dark blur whirs past a nearby window. On yet another TV in yet another apartment, Vicky states that the mayor has been hidden in his mansion since midday, unreachable for comment. With the city's leadership in doubt, who can Gothamites trust to protect them? Once again, shadows dart outside. This time, the camera follows them, revealing Batman, Robin, and Batgirl soaring across the rooftops. It's free roam time, and the player gets to choose whichever character they want to play as. Alfred briefs the Bat family on the open investigations around the city, and the player can do whatever they want, but the next main mission needs to be initiated by Batgirl. Batgirl gets a call in her comms from Alfred that he's located an incident that fits the pattern she's been looking into. The mission begins when she arrives at a corner store. The basement has been burnt up, and it's covered in fresh police tape. The player walks in to find a Street Demons, with a Z, drug lab that's been ransacked and destroyed. According to Alfred, this is the fourth one that's been reported over the last few nights. She had asked Alfred to monitor any thefts involving chemicals, suspecting Mother could be behind them for whatever toxin she used on Batman. During a crime scene investigation, Batgirl notes that a certain chemical used to make fever, the gang's signature street drug, has been stolen, which Alfred corroborates is what happened at the previous scenes. The demons were not attacked by a rival street gang. This was a professional, well-coordinated attack. The player exits the basement and is accosted by some of the gangsters returning to their hideout, so the player has to kick some butt. Afterward, Alfred alerts her that Robin is responding to a robbery in progress at a dockyard, which may be of interest to her also. The player travels over, coming upon the sound of a wailing warehouse alarm. Injured dock workers tend to each other as Robin speaks with a flustered manager. He smiles and calls her over, telling the manager to repeat everything he said, but slower, and to use punctuation. He shouts that a couple freaks in pajamas barged into the place and stole a dozen barrels of chemicals. This is his first night as manager, after the previous one was fired, now he's afraid he's gonna lose his job if they can't help him. Batgirl asks if there are any barrels left. The manager points to one, and she rushes over, plunging her batarang into it, much to the manager's dismay. Robin tries to soothe him, telling him this is just how Batgirl deals with her anger. The player is able to use the barrel to isolate traces of the chemical in the air using detective vision. Then, the heroes take off, with Robin promising the manager they've got his back. The player follows the trail of chemicals across the city, which ends at a ballet school. Odd. The player needs to sneak inside, where there's a small troupe of ballet dancers rehearsing on a mock stage. The heroes move quietly in the rafters and sneak behind the curtain to find a door, which bursts open, launching the pair through the curtain onto center stage. The dancers panic and dart out of the way as two big ninja-like bruisers clad in all white emerge for a fight. The player has to take them down. Once that's done, Mother chimes in over the intercom, saying how disappointed she is in Robin and Batgirl. He's wasted potential, and she doesn't even deserve to swim in his wake. Allow me to show you the power of a mother's love. 
Cynthia? Yes, mother. The ballet instructor snaps too. Die. The instructor snaps her own neck, and all the heroes could do was watch. Mother tells the rest of her orphans to play nice with Batman's children, and the dancers leap into action, fighting like emotionless, thoughtless robots. So, these are orphans, and they're going to be a reoccurring enemy type. To make them unique, they need to be taken down four times. The reason is that they won't stop unless you break all their limbs. Gruesome, I know, but isn't it also kinda cool? It doesn't need to be too graphic. Batman's always breaking bones in these games. That's just how much damage these guys will endure for Mother. It also means the orphans are a significant threat. One equals four basic goons, and that's just the grunt orphan. The big guys, the bruiser mini-bosses, I want to say each one is equivalent to eight basic goons. Maybe that's too spongy, but I think adding a rare enemy type that's wholly distinct from any other would at least keep combat in this game fresh. After all, it is the sixth one in this fantasy franchise I've concocted. Things need to be mixed up here and there. Anyway, Batgirl and Robin have to take on seven basic orphans total. As the fight gets going, Batgirl asks if they could be with the League of Assassins. Robin says white isn't in their dress code, but it's likely Talia being in Gotham is no coincidence. When the final orphan goes down, the player initiates an interrogation, but all the orphan can say is, Mother knows best. The heroes are obviously a little freaked out by this, now understanding a bit more about the mother who knocked Batman on his ass last night. The player continues their investigation into the back room and finds a hidden stash of barrels. That more than confirms it, Mother's stockpiling this specific chemical for a reason, and she's acting quickly. She wants to make a move soon. Batgirl says she's going to fill Batman in, Robin says he'll contact the dock manager, who somehow ended up being the most normal guy they've met all night. Cut across town to Batman. Batgirl has just told him everything, and Robin chimes in that they need to track down the League. They need answers. Batman tells him he'll handle it, as their last encounter proved, Robin still isn't ready to face the highest echelons of the League. From here, Batman accesses a map of all the properties that Gardevia Holdings owns across Gotham and deduces the target most likely to be attacked. Batman bargains that the League don't have much more information than they do, why else would Shiva be keeping an eye on Robin? So it's about getting into the mind of a trained assassin, which property would Talia al Ghul seek out? The Gotham Public Library. He hadn't realized the city sold off the library years ago. Although it's seen better days and there's civilian foot traffic, the draw isn't what it used to be, and the front of a public building would make a decent amount of people coming and going unsuspicious. More importantly, it's one of the oldest buildings in Gotham City. What's on the surface is technically the fifth and sixth stories of the original library, which was built on top of with the rest of old Gotham. So the original levels lead into what is now Catacombs, where there's plenty of space for an operation to hide. That's where the player heads. Once outside, there's no obvious sign of any League scouts, but Batman remarks he wasn't expecting it to be that easy. While he's here, he might as well investigate his suspicions. The player activates detective mode and scans the few people who come and go from the library over the next moment. One stands out to his sensors, a man concealing a dagger. The player follows the man, sneaking inside the library and trailing him through the furthest recesses of the building until they both enter the shadows. Batman activates his night vision mode, painting the world a thick green, but the man is gone and there's no door. Time to figure this out. The player does some environmental investigation and finds a trap door. They drop beneath it into a catacombs tunnel lit by torch. Just before Batman hits the ground, the player is prompted to dodge a sword flying at his neck. He flings himself backward and lands on his feet, skidding across a layer of dirt on stone. Talia al Ghul stands before him, blade pointed at his chest. She smirks. He's as good as her father said. Batman says he doesn't accept compliments from madmen. No? And would you also deny their daughters? Talia circles him. He tells her he was hoping to find her, but he's not looking for a fight. She slashes at him from behind with her scimitar. The player is prompted to evade. More blows continue to come. Evade, 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 and finally counter by sweeping her leg. Bouncing off the ground, Talia al Ghul's scowl is laced with joy. Batman remains in a defensive stance, but she tells him they're done for now. In a real fight, she would not permit him this breather, and sheathes her sword. Talia tells him they should proceed. Her lady-in-waiting has been scouting up ahead, 
Then she takes off. The player follows, traversing through this catacomb in a puzzly kind of way, shimmying here and there, doing the occasional gadget trick to get past a certain obstacle, with Talia al Ghul occasionally taunting or helping out. All the while, Batman asks why Talia is here. She could ask him the same thing. He says he already told her he wants to talk. So speak, Talia snaps. What is it you need of me? Tell me about mother. Ah, so you've met her. Did she make you an offer? Talia goes on to explain that the Silver Lady has been in partnership with the League of Assassins since Talia was young. Raish and she had a partnership. She would take in the orphans from the lands devastated in Raish's crusades, at first for the reciprocation of being under Raish's protection. Not long after, she began resupplying the orphans back as inductees into the League. At first, Raish refused. But as the waters burrowed further into his mind, his standards for apprenticeship loosened. Mother began churning out her lesser children for use by the elite of the underworld. Through some sorcery, she was able to shape them into whatever served her needs. Perfect servants, perfect wives, perfect puppet politicians. Mother's nursery flourished under the protection of the League, but that changed two months ago. One night, out of nowhere, Mother's orphans infiltrated Nanda Parbat and attempted to assassinate Raish. This failed, as the great Raish al Ghul cannot be felled so easily, and Mother fled. She and her entire operation have been off the radar since. It was only by chance that Lady Shiva happened to be in Gotham that she caught wind of Mother's operations. Only Talia came to corroborate her claims, which now seem genuine. Just so happened to be in Gotham. Got it. Batman goes on to reassure her that Mother is here, but asks why she would pick Gotham. Talia laughs, asking what better place to hide from the ones who want you dead than in the nest of their greatest enemy. At the end of this little jaunt, they find Lady Shiva, who is infuriated at the sight of Batman. The two do the equivalent of grunt at each other, then Shiva speaks to Talia. The player can survey the area as Shiva speaks. What they're looking at is a hidden lab. Massive glass containers filled with swirling liquids are connected to twisted machinery that line the walls. In the center works a sole scientist. He is surrounded by ten orphans. To get to the scientist, they must take out at least five orphans without being discovered, and then be prepared to fist fight the remaining five. The orphans can be taken down stealthily in a dual team situation. Good thing we got three characters running around. Talia and Lady Shiva will swoop in to help the player, both in predator mode and when it switches to combat. After asses have been blasted, the scientist tries to make a run for it, but is pinned to the wall by Talia's throwing knife. The interrogation begins. Shiva recognizes him from her prior dealings with the nursery, Dr. Hellfern, who sports a monocle and Van Dyke beard. Talia demands to know where Mother is. Hellfern tries to make himself small and whimpers that Mother's never trusted him with her whereabouts. Batman grabs Hellfern, his sleeve tears from the knife, and smashes his head into one of the glass chemical vats. Liquid leaks onto his face as Batman demands to know what he was making here. What's Mother planning? What kind of weapon is it? Hellfern laughs. We're creating the cure for all pain. One of the downed orphans tears into an electrical wire with his teeth, igniting himself and the floor on fire, which roars across the lab, racing up the spilled chemicals and igniting Hellfern's face with an explosion that rockets Batman, Talia, and Shiva back. In the haze of the smoke, Batman wraps Hellfern in his cape, extinguishing the flame, and carries his unconscious body away with Talia and Shiva in tow. Outside, the Batmobile pulls up. He places Hellfern into the back of the car and reattaches his cape around his shoulders. Talia says she'll want to speak to that fool when he comes to. Batman tells her to leave Gotham and Mother to him. He won't allow any more death. He just wants to know one thing. Do the orphans stay like that forever? Talia holds Batman's eye for a moment, then asks what offer Mother made him. Just then, Alfred rings Batman, Master Bruce. He broadcasts news audio into his cowl. The mayor just fired Police Commissioner Gordon. The talking heads discuss the latest press release and theorize why the mayor would do this. Is he trying to shift blame onto police leadership? Another fire rises to meet you, detective, Talia says, walking off as the Batmobile peels out. What will you do? The player takes control of the Batmobile, racing into the GCPD. On the way, Batman asks Alfred to look into a Dr. Hellfern. He's a lead into Mother's nursery operation. Let's see. PhD in chemistry from Central City University, his experiments with biological weaponry at LexCorp earned him the nickname Dr. Death. Charming. 
After a brief stint there, he disappeared to Eastern Europe nearly 10 years ago. If this mother is as bad as your recent log suggests, Helfern is no doubt a valued asset. Batman tells Alfred they don't have to worry about Helfern anymore, but asks him to keep digging into his time in Europe. It could hold some answers. The player arrives at the GCPD HQ and exits the vehicle. Batman tells two officers to get paramedics. Just then, the bat signal ignites the sky. The player reaches the rooftop to find a lone figure, silhouetted by the signal, smoking a cigar. What's going on? The light goes down. Detective Harvey Bullock's hand is on the switch. The entire city's lost its goddamn mind. Bullock flicks his cigar. Batgirl arrives, perching above them. Where's Gordon? Before word came in, he was heading to the mayor's mansion for a meeting. Bullock grunts. Haven't been able to contact him since. I wouldn't be surprised if he dumped his cell so it's harder to track him. With all the nut jobs loose, it's open season on the ex commish who put them all away. We have to find him, Batgirl says. What do you need from me? Bullock asks. You got the full backing of the GCPD. Keep the GCPD focused on the city, Batman says. The city's going to hell, Bullock shouts. If there's anyone who can survive with the entire city against them, it's Jim Gordon. He'll want us to focus on protecting the most people we can. Batgirl jumps down. She doesn't agree. Batman asks where she would begin. If he doesn't want to be found, what can they do? Where would they even start? No. Batman suspects that if they continue as they have been, sooner or later, they'll find him. Batgirl begrudgingly accepts this logic, but Bullock protests, saying that Batman's just gonna sit on his ass and wait for Jim to point him in the right direction as always, rather than doing everything he can to save his friend. The difference between Batman and Gordon is that Gordon's proactive, while Batman's merely reactive. Batman walks off, and Bullock unholsters his pistol, saying that he turned on the damn signal, so Batman's gonna do what he wants for a change. Batman and Batgirl look back, then leap off the building. Infuriated, Bullock fires at the bat signal, shattering the symbol in the night sky. The characters split off, with the player continuing to have control over Batman, who radios Alfred that he's gonna pay the mayor a visit. A move like this, in the time of a crisis, is too illogical. There must be an ulterior motive. He suspects the mayor could be one of Mother's orphans. So, the player's prompted to head toward the mayor's mansion, a gated gothic estate on the outskirts of Gotham surrounded by a decent-sized park. It's obvious right away that something foul is afoot. The yard has been vandalized, and the security patrolling the perimeter are dressed in guard dog costumes. Batman tells Alfred to alert the police, then the player needs to discreetly take these thugs out before heading inside. The player enters through the front door to find a grisly scene. The dead bodies of staff members litter the ground. On the second floor balcony, out steps the Joker, adorned in a purple bathrobe and holding a blood-splattered newspaper. What a pleasant surprise! Our first house guest! Well, come on in! Make yourself at home! I know I have. <laughs> Where's Mayor Kroll? Junior? Well, Harley's putting her in her bed right now. She'll be out in a jiff. In the meantime, can I get you anything? Coffee? Tea? How about you play with the pooches? The player swarmed by a dozen more goons in guard dog inspired outfits who need to be bashed and beaten. Once completed, the player zips up to the second story as the Joker runs away, announcing he's gonna see what's taking Harley so long. It's rude to keep their guest waiting. The player snags the Joker with the bat claw, then smashes him against the wall, cracking the plaster. Batman demands to know why he did this. Joker giggles saying he wanted to give the whole family thing the old suburban try. Just then, a mallet breaks through the wall, hitting Batman squarely in the ribs, which sends him hurtling through another wall. Leave poor Mr. J alone. He's got a mortgage to pay now. The boss fight begins. Harley is dressed as a 1950s housewife with a red and black patterned house dress, white gloves, and a handkerchief tied around her neck. Armed with her handy dandy mallet, which she uses to tear apart the walls of the second story, she's really putting pressure on the player who needs to dodge her unpredictable attacks and counter to do damage of their own. All the while, Joker and Harley exposit over their scheme. Jealous of Batman's growing family, they decided to try parenting themselves. They're playing a mad game of house with Mayor Kroll as their son, Junior. Unfortunately, child rearing is harder than they thought. He's been acting out, calling bureaucrats and redirecting city funds all in the middle of a crisis. Declaring the commissioner public enemy number one was the last straw. Harley gave him a spanking and sent him to bed. Although, Joker says, I may have encouraged him a bit on that one. Once the player has Harley on the back foot, Joker runs off to check on Junior. 
After the player defeats her, they rush upstairs and catch Joker yet again. Batman demands to know the real reason he chose to kidnap the mayor. Joker smiles, saying poor Sionis thinks they formed an alliance, that he's gonna help take the new guy out so Black Mask can control Gotham again. Boring. There's a meeting of villainous minds taking place tonight at the Gotham Dome, and Joker just wants to see the new guy get spanked. Speaking of spanking, Joker kicks in the adjacent door where the mayor, dressed in oversized baby clothes with a binky gagged in his mouth, is trapped in a massive crib rigged with explosives. Ah, they grow up so fast. Too fast, in fact. All the whining, the crying, the begging. <laughs> I just don't want him anymore! Joker clicks a remote in his pocket, and Batman tosses him aside. He's at the mercy of your adoption system now, Bats! Joker giddily leaps out the third story window. Now the player has to solve this death trap on a timer to free the mayor. Once that's done, Batman rips the binky from the mayor's mouth and grabs him by his bib. He asks what he knows about Mother, to which the mayor says, Mother knows best. His lips start to darken and curl. Batman looks to the binky and sees that it's been laced in Joker toxin. Over and over again, the mayor says, Mother knows best, as he begins cackling louder and louder. The police, led by Rene Montoya, reach the house and head upstairs. Batman leads the mayor to them and pauses for a moment, leaning against a wall and grimacing in pain as he grips his ribs, then regains composure and radios Alfred. He tells him he's heading for the Gotham Dome. Alfred warns him that it's certainly a trap, and Batman says that's highly likely, but this is the best lead they have. Alfred goes on to say that he found out a little bit more about Dr. Helfern. He appears to have a connection to the criminal organization Hive. Based on recent communications Alfred was able to access, it appears Helfern was orchestrating some kind of deal between them and Mother. Batman suspects Hive wants the same arrangement as the League, an army of perfect soldiers. He thanks Alfred and takes off. The player shifts into controlling Batgirl during free roam. Her inner monologue focuses on her anxiety over Gordon's situation and the balancing act she has to perform with her father as both the naive loving daughter and secret kick-ass vigilante. She knows that Batman is probably right. If she lets emotion drive her, she'll be less efficient, but Dad's all she has left. The next mission kicks off when Alfred chimes in over the communicator. There are reports of citizens running crazed through the streets near her location running for their lives and attacking one another. She doesn't want to respond. She wants to search for her father, but she thinks about the real mission, protecting people, just like her dad has done all these years no matter the personal burden, and so the player heads to the location. Once they arrive, the player finds police in gas masks trying to quell a mini riot. No doubt about it, fear toxin. Alfred alerts her that this gas seems to be spreading in a rather unusual pattern. It's not radiating out from a single point, but rather traveling along roadways. Batgirl says she'll keep an eye out for a vehicle, then puts on a mini mask from her belt, and the player descends to street level. Unfortunately, they've got to take out rioting civilians first, then isolate the toxin compounds in the air, pick up a trail with detective vision, and head off in pursuit of the source. At the end of the trail, the player doesn't find a vehicle, but instead a swarm of rats that are running alongside the sidewalk, spreading the toxin into the air around them. The player is prompted to stop the swarm, sending Batgirl down onto the road in front of the rats. She throws a sonic batarang on the ground, the sound of which causes the rats to peel off, scurrying into nearby storm drains. After basking in her success for a moment, Batgirl realizes two things. The first is that Ratcatcher is partnered up with Scarecrow, gross. The second is that she has to head into Gotham City's sewers, omega gross. So the player finds the nearest manhole cover and slides down into the muck. It's pitch black in the tunnels, so the player activates Batgirl's night vision mode, painting the world that familiar thick green color, and they pick up the rat trail, which leads to some spelunking. The trusty grappling gun can only get the player so far in this good old traversal challenge with a detective twist. After much shimmying, leaping, and stepping through Gotham's finest export, Batgirl realizes that the shifting mass she's moving through is no longer just sewage, but a swarm of swimming rats. Out of the water bursts Ratcatcher, in all his disgusting glory, who grabs Batgirl from behind and plucks the mask off her face. The world spins around her, she's gotten her first taste of fear toxin. The player lashes out at Ratcatcher, but he dissipates into a pile of rats. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. The player rushes toward it, turning the corner to find themselves in the Gordon family living room. The fireplace is crackling, 
Jim Gordon is hunched over the hearth, a glass of whiskey in his hand, looking into the flames. He turns around and sees Barbara. He tells her she did a good job today at the funeral. She's such a strong girl. He knows her mother would be proud. It's a good thing she died while you were young, before she could see what a disappointment you'd become. Gordon grows two feet. A cowardly criminal. He grows a bit more. An unrepentant liar. He grows another few feet. A failure, unworthy of my legacy. He bursts through the ceiling, rubble crashes down around the player. Once again, the world shifts around them until the player finds themselves in some twisted representation of Batgirl's life, colored by an increasingly strained relationship with her father, and a guilt-slash-inferiority complex, with Gordon towering over everything in the center of the area, a la the original Scarecrow levels from Arkham Asylum. So the player needs to maneuver through all this to break free of this trance. Of course, there are flashes of Ratcatcher intermixed throughout to remind the player of the reality unfolding beneath the hallucination. Batgirl is able to break free by accepting that this is all in her head, that the monster in the middle isn't her father, the real James Gordon is still out there, in danger and in need of help. Some freaky rat gimp isn't going to stop her from being there for him like he's always been there for her. She breaks free. Reality snaps into place as the player delivers a blow to Ratcatcher, knocking his creep ass out and sending his rats scattering. With a moment to breathe, Batgirl realizes she stumbled into some kind of underground lab. This must have been where Scarecrow was working on this batch of toxin. But why give it to Ratcatcher, and where is he? Wait, are those the same chemicals Mother's people have been collecting? Just then, she hears cries. She turns the corner and finds three men in cells, the victims of fear toxin experimentation. She frees them, but realizes they've gouged their own eyes out. They think she's Ratcatcher and beg Flanagan to let them go, pleading that they regret their involvement in his incarceration. Batgirl tells them there's nothing to be afraid of. She's gonna make sure they're okay, and alerts Alfred for help. Cut back to the surface. Batgirl has a newfound resolve to find her father as soon as possible, so she's going to the GCPD to take Bullock up on his offer. There's free roam in between, but the mission gets started when Batgirl arrives inside police headquarters, which would be one of a couple in-game hubs, and tells Bullock as much. He says he's already putting a small task force together. Just then, Robin exits the corridor where they're holding Riddler, and declares they've got a problem. Riddler's latest intel suggests the GCPD is going to be attacked. Bullock says their manpower is limited due to the whole Mayor-Joker situation happening around the same time. They have the firepower to hold back just about anything, but they don't have the bodies. Robin tells him they'll have to make do. They need to lock this building down immediately. The surrounding police all look at each other, unsure what to do. You heard the man, Bullock shouts. Lock this place down. The player, controlling Batgirl and Robin, needs to do some reconnaissance outside. They'll be the first line of defense against anything that's coming. While the player is investigating certain attack routes and setting up traps, the characters get to talking. Robin wants to know how she's holding up about her father. She says it's eating at her, but she knows how strong he is. Changing the subject, she asks how his college orientation went. Robin says he met some cool people, but he still feels unsure about the whole thing. Something just doesn't feel right. She asks him if he's worried he'll be homesick. Miss Gotham, Robin laughs. Well, I guess it is the only home I've ever known. A few vans come flying down one of the sabotage streets, and the player is prompted to activate their trap at just the right time, detonating explosive gel and destroying the truck's tires, causing them to skid and crash. The player descends and starts kicking some goon ass. More trucks are coming from multiple routes now, so the characters split up. The player protects one route as Batgirl. When that's done, they swap over to Robin to protect another. This repeats for a total of five roads protected, until Batgirl is struck with a giant purple orb that seals her to a nearby wall. A van, covered in polka dots, soars past her. Cut back to Robin. The player is prompted to dodge a blast of electricity, which temporarily shorts out all power on the block. Another van races past, charioting Maxi Zeus. Robin radios Batgirl that he's falling back to protect the GCPD. She says she's still working her way out of a sticky situation. She'll catch up when she can. The player, as Robin, follows Maxi Zeus's van, which is now a smoldering wreck lodged into the side of the GCPD. The Olympus gang, adorned in togas and firing lightning guns, yes, 
lightning guns, are engaged with the police who are returning fire from the rooftop. However, the police are besieged by Polka Dot Man attacking from a neighboring roof. He's the most immediate threat, so the player needs to deal with that first, while the Olympus gang try to break through the GCPD fortifications. Now, Polka Dot Man is a weird and inconsistent character, but in this context, he uses his polka dots for specific functions. He has sticky polka dots, which can trap people, he's got incendiary dots, he's got big dots that act essentially like boulders, and he can make a pseudo force field out of dots. The snipers are taking cover from Polka Dot Man's barrage, and the player must do their best to close the gap to take him out. They'll be engaging in a lot of high flying action during this boss encounter, dodging various dot types to get close and destroy a portion of his dot supply. In the middle of the fight, Batgirl will radio that she's engaging the Olympians. Once the player defeats Polka Dot Man, the villain tries to push past Robin to his real objective, and with the last of his resources, destroys part of the GCPD ceiling, bringing himself and Robin tumbling down through multiple stories. Meanwhile, we flash back to when Batgirl radioed Robin, and the player takes on the Olympus Gang right as they breach the GCPD. Maxi Zeus steps up as support, so we've got another boss fight with lightning goons backing him up. Maxi is a ranged fighter with his lightning attacks, but the addition of goons gives the player some cover, and the GCPD sprinkler system becomes a good friend, eventually frying all these foes. Once the fight is over, Maxi stands up for one final ultimate attack, but is knocked unconscious by the falling debris of Polka Dot Man and Robin, collapsing through the ceiling. Both villains are down, and both heroes are reunited. That's when Bullock announces over a loudspeaker that another wave of criminals have infiltrated the building. They've managed to take hostages on the second floor, and a small group is trying to break into the evidence lockup. Once again, the characters split up. Batgirl goes to handle the situation on the second floor, encountering gangsters of the 1940s variety, holding cops hostage in a bid to buy time to break out the big man. The player needs to take out all these goons in a predator section. Afterward, control switches back to Robin, who has arrived near the evidence lockup, as the gangsters cut through the vault door with super advanced laser technology. Among them is the ventriloquist with his new interim puppet, Sako, which is just a sock with a similarly abusive personality as Scarface, but still distinct. Ventriloquist did all this to rescue Scarface from the evidence lockup. Getting to that is what this whole alliance with Polka Dot Man and Maxi Zeus was all about. The goons spot Robin as Ventriloquist runs into the vault, looking for Scarface, but as he does, Sako screams to take care of that brat once and for all. The goons start rifling through the rows of evidence and find some goodies. One gets a hold of Penguin's umbrella, another freeze grenades, another Humpty Dumpty's gadgetry, etc. The player needs to take out all these well-equipped goons however possible, all the while a ventriloquist is calling out to Scarface. Once the goons are down, the player hunts for the madman deep in the lockup to find Sako and Scarface arguing with ventriloquist caught in the middle. Robin tells him, it's over, there's nowhere left to run. Scarface tells the Boy Wonder to back off. He may have stood a chance when the sock was running things, but now he's back in control. Robin demands to know where Ventriloquist got the advanced tech. Sako asks Robin if he's dumb, same place the other two freaks got their new and improved toys. Scarface tells Sako to put a sock in it. Just then, the laser starts beeping. Sako asks what that is, Scarface tells Ventriloquist to spit it out, Ventriloquist looks at Robin and finally speaks. I just wanted things to go back to how they were. Boom. An explosion erupts, instantly killing the ventriloquist and sending Robin flying back, burying him under rubble. Cut to Batgirl, who hears two more explosions rattle throughout the building, where they left Polka Dot Man and Maxi Zeus. Bullock announces that the building is coming down. Everyone needs to evacuate. The player has to rush through the crumbling structure, make their way to Robin, yank him from the rubble, then escape the collapse through the whole ventriloquist explosion left. The GCPD crumbles in on itself as its occupants flee. Not quite collapsed, but certainly caved in. The real goal of this attack was to use these villains as unwilling suicide bombers. 
This was Prometheus' work, a recovering Robin whispers as Batgirl looks on in horror. Meanwhile, the player catches up with Batman. On Joker's word, he's heading to the Gotham Dome Stadium to confront Prometheus in the Skybox, which is a known haunt for the city's underworld leaders. Getting inside won't be easy, as the name suggests the stadium is a massive smooth dome with no way in from the top. The player will need to sneak in from the ground level and work their way up while avoiding detection. Despite the state of the city, there is a baseball game going on tonight between the Gotham Knights and the Bloodhaven Bloodhounds. The way up to the Skybox, which sits 500 feet above the field, is guarded by several levels of underworld security, intermixed with the occasional undercover orphan to keep them in line. The player must stealth and puzzle solve their way to that uber elite Skybox without raising any alarms. Once the player makes it up top to one of the adjoining catwalks, a conversation can be overheard from within the Skybox, and the player must sneak around to find a way inside. Mind you, this is no ordinary box at a stadium. This is an obscene mafioso hangout mockingly placed high above the stands. It's grand, luxurious, and ludicrous in its design, with one portion of the floor made out of clear glass for watching the game from a bird's eye view. Inside, Prometheus is holding court with Scarecrow at his side. He's speaking to Black Mask and Mr. Freeze. Essentially, he suggests that they form a pact to consolidate power in Gotham. His benefactor only needed Dr. Cranefried from the asylum, but he was convinced others would be of value. And we'd obscure your need for the Scarecrow, Freeze interjects. Very sharp, Prometheus is amused. Dr. Crane and Dr. Isley have already joined, he continues. And to offer proof of his capabilities, he presents a kidnapped Commissioner Gordon. The player continues to maneuver to an access point inside the room while Black Mask and Mr. Freeze give their two cents. Essentially, Black Mask is caddy, but Freeze is not ruling it out. Prometheus offers to show Victor one of the state-of-the-art labs where he can continue his research. He accepts, and Prometheus orders Scarecrow to show him the way. The two villains exit the skybox, leaving Prometheus sipping from a glass of wine at a large table, with Black Mask jabbering on about his demands while Gordon is tucked in a corner. It's only by this point that the player is in a position to enter the room. They initiate a takedown on Black Mask from the rafters. Welcome! Could you ask for better seats? Prometheus sips from his glass. You know, I used to go to games here as a kid. My parents would take me. I used to love this city. The corruption. The rot. You shouldn't have come home. Batman marches toward him. Funny, it doesn't feel like home anymore. Thanks to you. The ground shakes. Batman turns back, but he's too late. From the shadows emerges the hulking form of Bane, charging at Batman. He grabs him in one hand, raising him over his head and smashing him into the ground, cracking the glass floor ever so slightly. Batman coughs in pain, Every injury he sustained over the last two nights flares up. Prometheus made me an offer I couldn't refuse, Bane smiles, ripping Gotham from your hands. The Gotham Dome begins to open thanks to Prometheus, who remains in his chair sipping his wine and enjoying the show. The open dome reveals the Gotham City skyline in a full 360 degree view, twinkling and simmering as the perfect backdrop for this Bane vs Batman rematch. The player begins on the back foot, starting with only two thirds health. They need to do their best to avoid Bane, they can only take three hits total. The way they need to fight back is by targeting Bane's legs, bringing him to his knees, then getting in close to deliver some rapid body blows. Bane will lash out at the player, delivering a strong punch that, if dodged, will soar right through the glass floor. Bane will be stuck briefly, but long enough for the player to sever one of his venom tubes, which can be done with several gadgets timed just right. However, after the first tube is successfully severed, Prometheus picks Black Mask off the floor and throws him into the fray. He knew about Cyanus's foolish plot with the clown, he's grateful it led Batman into this trap, but now, if Cyanus wants to live, he needs to earn his keep. So as this fight continues against Bane, Black Mask acts as a standard goon who will swoop in to attack, keeping the player from focusing solely on Bane. The player will need to do a takedown on Black Mask to get him out of their hair. However, when that's executed, Prometheus will get the drop on the player, delivering a critical strike to one of the injuries Batman's incurred, like his rib damage from Harley, which takes out a sliver of the player's health. Then Prometheus dips off to watch from the sidelines once again. The next time Bane's tubing is severed, Prometheus forces Black Mask up once again, and repeat. All the while, Prometheus is monologuing that this trap is their little secret. Mother doesn't have to know. She'll be pissed when she hears, she thought she could forge an alliance with Batman, 
but they both know that was a fantasy. Sometimes she can be too kind. Once this fight is completed, Black Mask lays unconscious, beaten to a pulp. Bane wails in a rage, losing himself to the venom. He completely shatters the glass floor, then desperately tries to patch up his tubing. Batman struggles to stay on his feet, and Prometheus is suddenly behind him. Mother thinks she can change anyone, but I know the truth. He delivers a melee of blows that the player is prompted to counter, then his gauntlets ignite in a flash of electricity, frying Batman's chest and putting him off balance. Prometheus grabs Batman by the cape and hurls him at a recovering Bane. Some things just run too deep to ever change. They can only be broken. Prometheus nods. Bane lifts a struggling Batman above his head, above the silhouetted skyscrapers on the horizon, and slams him down over his knee. Batman screams in agony, and Bane collapses beside him. The player is prompted to crawl to safety, heading toward the door, but Prometheus's foot falls before Batman. He crouches down and says, I'm Gotham's true son, not you. Cut to the floor view from inside the stadium. The Jumbotron crackles, then shows Prometheus holding a broken Batman up by the back of his neck, displaying him for all of Gotham to see. He hurls Batman from the skybox, who plummets toward the field. In a state of half-consciousness, he just manages to soften his fall by partially gliding. The stadium is in a full-on panic after he crashes down. Citizens and athletes alike are running for their lives, leaving Batman immobile and alone in the infield, completely defeated. The world fades to black, as Alfred panics over the communicator. Robin! Batgirl! Is anyone there? Batman needs help! Can anyone hear me? Fade in on the back of a paramedic rushing into the stadium. The player takes control, maneuvering past the perimeter of first responders, through to the interior of the stadium, where a number of citizens are being treated for their injuries, and out onto the field where the Batman lies crumbled and unconscious. Several stadium security guards argue over what to do with him. The paramedic pushes between them and demands they help him move Batman onto his stretcher. He needs treatment right away. One guard obliges, and the paramedic gets moving again. Once no one is around, he whispers, Not to worry, Master Bruce. I'll take care of everything. I'll get you right as rain. You'll see. So, the paramedic is Alfred in disguise. From here on out, the goal is to sneak Batman out of the stadium before anyone takes him into their custody or tries to learn his secret identity. The player must lead Batman to an ambulance on the other side of the perimeter, avoiding clots of paparazzi or police to keep a low profile. They'll occasionally run into an NPC who Alfred smooth talks to keep moving. There are some rumblings about the commissioner's location in the background. Eyewitnesses saw him forced out of the stadium in the chaos. When the player reaches the ambulance, they open the doors to find Robin waiting in the back. He assists Alfred with loading Batman in, then the ambulance peels out with Batgirl behind the wheel, blaring the siren. Robin looks down at Batman and is petrified. We can't just go back to the cave. He needs a real hospital. I've repaired his body many. It's never been this bad before. How do we know he's not paralyzed? He could be dying. We've been here before, he and I. We've got to go to a hospital. We've got to save his life. His life is Batman. Take him to a hospital and you'll expose him. They may save his body, but we will have killed the man. Dick sits down, head in his hands. Alfred catches Barbara's eyes in the rear view. We will return to the cave and stabilize him. We will save Batman. Are we clear on that, Master Richard? Yes, Al. We're clear. Miss Gordon, please step on it. The camera lingers on Batman, laying unconscious on the stretcher, then fades to black. News footage from throughout the next morning plays out on screen. The city is in disarray. A mayor hospitalized and driven stark raving mad, the commissioner of police kidnapped, the Batman, nearly killed and now missing, Arkham unleashed. In the Batcave, Alfred finishes working on Bruce. He has bloodstains up to his forearms. Dick stands with his mask and cape off, half clothed in his Robin outfit, staring off into the darkness beside Bruce's unconscious body. Alfred places a bloodied hand on his shoulder and says, His pulse is stable. He's out of danger? Not quite. I can't get the spinal swelling to go down with what I have here. What do you need? A drug called Decadron for the treatment of spinal trauma. If it isn't applied within the next hour, I'm on my way. Fill me in over comms. Dick saddles up on his sweet bat hog and peels out of the cave, leaving Alfred with an unconscious Bruce and Ace whining at his side. It's still light out as Robin hits the road. 
The city is practically under martial law. The National Guard have been brought in to fortify the city's demoralized police force, but they've only managed to set up checkpoints here and there. Nothing is under control. The player roars through one of the checkpoints as Alfred calls in. He says the Decadron isn't an easy drug to find. His best bet is to go to Burnside College's state-of-the-art medical center and borrow some. Alfred suggests requesting Miss Gordon's assistance since she's familiar with the campus, but Robin refuses. Babs is busy tracking down any lead she can find from that skybox. She's looking for her father, and that mission is just as important. He can handle this himself. Alfred knows that he can, but wishes him luck anyway. The player arrives at the Burnside campus, breaks into the medical center, and acquires the drug Alfred requested. On the way out, Robin hears a scream from the psychology wing. He still has 40 minutes to get back to Bruce. He can't let the scream go unanswered. The player runs down corridors into the psych department as screams echo around every corner until finally they arrive in a small classroom where a dozen students are strapped to chairs and blindfolded. The player goes to untie them when they're suddenly hit with a cloud of white mist. Robin looks up to see a device attached to the ceiling vent. Then, he falls through a swirling darkness and emerges above the earth, gliding gently down to the ground like a feather. It's nighttime, but the world is warm with sparkling lights and nostalgic, jovial songs. He realizes he's above Haley's circus and floats through the big tent. As he descends, he sees a ringmaster entertaining the crowd, remarking he hasn't seen old Jacques performing in years, but the man's still got it. The player takes control after Robin touches down. It's time to figure out how to break free of this vision. The player quickly learns it's impossible to get outside the tent, so Robin decides to head straight to Mr. Haley's office to figure things out. Mr. Haley, I presume. There's something odd going on in your circus. Ah, hey kid. Jeez, I can hear ya. Keep your voice down. Oh, I'm sorry? It's just, have you noticed anything strange lately? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll bet your parents were okay with it. How about I just go and ask him myself? He's not lying. This time. Mary Grayson walks into the office in her full Flying Grayson's leotard. Robin stumbles back. He's ready. John Grayson places his hand on Dick's shoulders, who is suddenly 14 again, back in his own Flying Grayson's leotard. No, 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 Dick mutters. Signal Jacques will be out in two, Mary tells Dick, and John closes the door behind them. The line, Dick shouts to himself. The player is prompted to race back to the ring, but the world falls out from underneath them, leaving only a couple slivers of walkway for the player to traverse. Dick trembles, fearing that he'll fall, that he'll die if he goes out there. The player needs to go through with this traversal obstacle course above a limitless void. Eventually, Dick questions what he's so afraid of. The fear of heights he felt after his parents died was one of the first things Bruce helped him get over. Suddenly, the world snaps back into place, and the player is atop the trapeze. Mary Grayson is behind them. She asks if Dick's nervous. He lies and says he's not. He can see his father on the opposite side, who gives him a big thumbs up. Mary says that Dick has been practicing the quadruple somersault for months. She knows he can do it with no net. Forget about everyone else and just do it for yourself. The player is prompted to swing out on the trapeze and then to let go. Dick Grayson, the boy wonder, pulls off the quadruple somersault, and is caught in midair by his father. He can't help but feel happy and content, smiling through the air. The lights go out. There are two loud thuds. A shriek. Panic. Darkness. Eventually, a spotlight shines down, illuminating a mobster in a pinstripe suit as he runs away. It's Tony Zuko. The player gives chase as the light source stays on Tony. Throughout this chase, the player needs to fight off occasional batches of Zuko's goons. Finally, they catch Zuko and are prompted to beat him over and over, each hit slightly dimming the light until it dies out. In the darkness, the player is prompted to press X to kill. Once that button is pressed, the controller begins to tremble. Nothing is seen in the darkness, but the sound of choking fills the air. Then, a small but bright light comes into focus from the side. It's revealed to be a helmet light atop Bruce Wayne's head. Adorned in spelunking gear, he tells Dick it's safe to follow him. Bruce vanishes as the light flares and sears Robin, splitting him into two distinct beings, one made of light and one made of darkness. The player controls the light Robin and needs to defeat the dark one who is trying to kill Zuko. Once the player does so, the world is consumed by light. 
The voice of his mother echoes around him. I knew you could do it. Robin comes to consciousness in the classroom, having passed out on the floor. The player is prompted to shatter the dispersal device in the ceiling with a shuriken, then untie the victims. He asks who did this to them, and all they can mutter is Scarecrow. Alfred calls Robin, asking if he has the drug. Time is running out. Robin says he's heading back now, but Alfred needs to alert the GCPD about these kids. As the victims flee, Robin lingers in the hall, glancing at an orientation poster of two parents proudly waving their son off to school. Then he's gone. At this point, the player swapped back into control of Batgirl in free roam. She laments her inability to pick up any trail on Prometheus, or the so-called Pact, but there is still one lead she's yet to follow up on. The player is prompted to head to the new, makeshift GCPD headquarters, which is across town in the Amusement Mile district. Once the player chooses to step inside, Batgirl is met by Bullock, who asks how the bat is. He's hoping they had something to do with his disappearance. She tells him he's being treated as they speak. Bullock hoped he'd run into her. With the bat signal falling into the old building's rubble, he didn't know how to contact them. On their little walk and talk, Batgirl informs Bullock about Prometheus, and that Gordon was taken by him. Bullock wants to help, but unfortunately, he won't be able to provide much support at the moment because a good deal of his people have gone missing, and he needs to handle that. But if she hears anything solid about the commish, he asks to be contacted right away. Batgirl agrees, and says that an inmate in the infirmary may have what they're looking for. Once inside the infirmary, the player pulls back a curtain to find that Dr. Helfern is dead. Jesus Christ. Bullock runs off to get help as Batgirl looks at the body. This just happened. From the shadows, a League ninja lashes out, but the player blocks the blade. Then the ninja jumps out the window. The player chases and manages to catch the ninja, but they are beset upon by two more. Once those ninjas are defeated, Batgirl recovers lists of names from their bodies. Some have already been crossed off. They're hit lists. She calls the cave and Robin answers. First, she asks how Bruce is doing. He says Alfred's working his magic. Then she asks how he's doing. He pauses before asking her the same thing. Point taken, she cuts to the chase. The League has brought reinforcements to Gotham and are making their first move against Mother by targeting suspected operatives. She wants him to run the names and addresses of those not yet crossed off these lists. She needs to get to these people first. They're her only hope of tracking down her father's whereabouts. Robin replies that only one name hasn't been reported killed or missing tonight. Maxwell Ducey, the COO of Galaxy Communications. Well, he was before the Morgan Edge Superman incident last year. Robin provides her with the address to Maxwell's penthouse, and the player takes off. When they arrive, the penthouse is in tatters with a dead orphan and two dead League ninjas on the floor. There are clear signs of a fight, but no sign of Maxwell. The player needs to do some crime scene reconstruction to break down exactly what happened here and where Maxwell got off to. The long and short of it is that League ninjas snuck in to kill Maxwell, but were ambushed by hidden orphans. Maxwell managed to escape through his private elevator to the parking garage. Batgirl picks up his tire tracks and follows them across town to the old Galaxy Communications building, a squat but wide corporate headquarters which has been overrun by weeds and plant life. Time to scope it out! The player traverses over to a section of the rooftop that is one massive skylight. Down below is a food court turned greenhouse where various goons are moving materials in the same mindless motions as the guards at Arkham. Clearly, Poison Ivy is here. Batgirl lets Robin know what she's found and tells him she's going in. She can't let Ivy slip away. The player needs to wrap around to the front, blow apart a weak wall with explosive gel, and enter the building which is teeming with plant life. Over the intercom, Ivy is giving orders to her puppets, telling them they have no time to waste to move as fast as their feeble, fleshy bodies will allow. Notably, there's no sign of Maxwell. The general layout and aesthetic of this building would be a fun way to poke fun at the modern Silicon Valleyfication of late-stage capitalism. It's a sleek, open layout, often impractical with hollow corporate jargon smeared everywhere it can be. As the player passes a sign promoting Galaxy Broadcasting's core values of rockstar leadership, compassionate listening, and uncompromising synergy, Batgirl comes upon goons moving to and fro. But not being seen is the name of the game here, since once she begins taking out goons, Ivy will realize. So the player remains hidden as they start moving throughout this great hall filled with workstations, conference rooms, and offices. Batgirl is trying to piece together Ivy's goal. 
Her puppets are moving a lot of advanced technology stripped from the lower levels of the complex. It's not like Ivy's some engineering wizard, nor does she incorporate tech into her crimes. Something isn't adding up. When the player reaches the entrance to the food court, League of Assassins ninjas suddenly emerge from the shadows and begin killing Ivy's puppets. Those are innocent people under mind control. Batgirl cannot let that stand, even if it gives away her position. So the player jumps into the action and must fend off a swarm of ninjas combined with Ivy's ungrateful puppets. From here, the player storms into the food court. Ivy is above Batgirl on the second level fending off a squadron of ninjas until she is blindsided with a splash of some blue chemical concoction. An unmasked ninja, so you know it's a named character, calls it her special weed killer. The chemical begins burning Ivy's flesh. She needs to focus all her concentration on fighting off any biological change, leaving her vulnerable in an already weakened state. In an act of desperation, she raises her arms and plants erupt from the ground, creating a labyrinth that stretches to the ceiling. Batgirl is trapped in the maze with everyone else, so it's time for some ninja and mind-controlled goon punching. As the player makes their way deeper into the maze, the unmasked ninja leader taunts Ivy. This is her fault for partnering with such a monster. Repercussions were inevitable. Tonight, all Mother's operatives will die. As the player nearly clears the maze, the ninja leader turns her attention to Batgirl, asking why she would stand in the way of destroying a shared enemy. Does she not seek revenge? Ivy, Prometheus, Mother, they all deserve death. Just before the end of the maze, the leader bursts through one of the hedge walls and tackles Batgirl. They roll out into the courtyard garden, where Ivy is healing under the shade of an ancient oak. You're going to stop, Batgirl says. A daughter of the demon gives in to no demands, Nissa Rocco says. The player charges at Talia's younger sister, and we've got ourselves a boss fight a la Deathstroke. Hard and fast, close quarters combat. Nissa is assisted by her remaining ninjas, but Batgirl is given support by none other than Poison Ivy. The player manages to defeat Nissa and demands answers. Where's Ducey? Dead before he even walked through the door. How many members of the League are in Gotham? Nissa coughs out that it matters not. The walls are closing in on Mother. Batgirl breaks her arm. Do you know where Commissioner Gordon is being held? Nissa scoffs, saying they have no interest in such an incompetent man. If he is Mother's prisoner, he will be collateral damage in her destruction. Batgirl knocks her unconscious. She walks over to Ivy, who is still healing but has secretly been burrowing into the soil. Ivy questions why Batgirl would protect her. You know us pig-headed heroes and our justice. So you heard my questions. Is that the reason you're staying… potted? Mother would know where Prometheus is keeping the Commissioner. If you want to get to her, pay the Gallery of Wax a visit. We are even. You will not be spared. Ivy sinks into the earth. Batgirl catches her breath, smirks to herself, then takes off. From here, the player picks up with Robin in the Batcave. Alfred has administered the drug and seems relieved. Now, all they can do is wait for Bruce to wake up. Robin thanks him and says to keep him posted. Alfred grabs his arm and demands to know where he's going. Robin asks what he expects him to do. The city is tearing itself apart. Alfred scowls. But then his eyes soften and he lets go. He isn't happy, but he understands. After all these years, he knows better than to try and stop a young man on a mission. His priority is still treating Bruce, but he'll help him and Miss Gordon any way that he can. This won't stop Batman, why should it stop us? Robin looks at Bruce. Do you really think I can make it on my own? Alfred places a firm hand on his shoulder. I pray you'll never have to. Now go. Alfred pushes Robin forward, and the player takes off out of the cave. It's free roam time, and the player needs to interact with some side activities before the next mission triggers. When it does, Alfred calls Robin about a developing incident at The Hidden Treasure, a casino located in the Diamond District. He doesn't have specifics, but police have been called in, and the business is owned by Killer Croc's financier, Warren White, so it's likely something fishy is going on. The player arrives to find that the police have a perimeter around the building. Robin drops down to speak with Montoya. They have reports of Black Mask's false face society tearing the place apart. No doubt some kind of territory play against Killer Croc's gang. The player goes inside to find the lavish, or grotesque, display of access that is Warren White's oceanic-themed Gambling Atlantis. 
Robin, nor Batman for that matter, have dealt with White directly, so these are uncharted waters for the hero. The situation here isn't so much an intergang conflict as it is a siege. Small batches of White security are held up in key checkpoints protecting his office, but they're outmanned and outgunned, and the False Face Society have taken hostages. The player needs to take out these different patches of goons, saving hostages and cracking the occasional security lockdown to move deeper into the casino and closer to Warren White. The gimmick design of this casino Casino should be doing some real heavy lifting and creating a fun atmosphere with unique opportunities for stealth. Maybe manipulating the games to distract goons, for example. Either way, by the time the player has managed to find a sneaky way into White's executive office, Mr. Freeze kicks in the door. He's leading a squad of false face goons holding bags full of money from the vault downstairs, but now he's come for Mr. White. He demands to know where his boss is hiding these days. White isn't used to any physical confrontations. He's a money man in an expensive suit, gambling on criminal enterprises. He breaks right away, saying he always meets Croc at the runoff by a Paro point. That's all he knows. Free speaks into the communicator. You are right, a Paro point. Happy hunting. White demands that in exchange for his cooperation, Free should leave his money behind. Freeze doesn't dignify the request with a response, and merely blasts White face with his Freeze gun. This is when the player finally manages to break into the room. Catching Freeze off guard and knocking him back into a large corridor, the walls of which are covered with massive shark tanks, aquarium style. Freeze smashes up the tanks and freezes the water spilling out, morphing the environment to his advantage with large, beached sharks snapping around the room. It's time for a boss fight. I think this new setting and the addition of goons backing Freeze up creates enough of a difference that the gameplay can largely ape off the Arkham City fight formula of using the environment to your advantage. This boss fight ends with Robin knocking Freeze out. He rushes over to check on Warren White, who is suffering from hypothermia. Paramedics arrive to take him away, but they say he'll likely be scarred for life. Frustrated with how things played out, Robin marches off with his sights set on a paro point. The player has the option to do some free roam activities, but once they arrive at the sewer runoff entrance near a paro point, the next mission begins. Robin holds his nose and descends into the dark stankness in his search for Killer Croc and whoever's hunting him. It's not long until the player picks up Croc's trail, which eventually shows signs of a struggle. The player needs to piece together this trail to follow Croc down the right tunnels while also parkouring through the sewer. Similar to Batgirl's big sewer adventure, grappling is limited in this traversal puzzle which leads the player to a maintenance area. Suddenly, Killer Croc comes soaring through a brick wall. Robin manages to dodge out of the way, however, thunderous footsteps rock the ground, and Bane comes charging after Croc through the wall, tackling both Robin and Croc over the edge and down into the rushing sewer water below. As he tumbles, Robin thinks to himself that he doesn't stand a chance under these conditions. The pair of villains continue their fight as the water carries them away, and the goal for the player is to survive long enough to make it back to dry land and keep these psychos from killing each other. This is a level unlike any from previous Arkham games, so I know I'm leaving quite a bit up to the imagination, but I'm picturing a situation where the player needs to dart left, right, up or down to dodge incoming debris. Then, at critical moments in the Croc Bane fight, the player needs to fire the grappling gun at them, fly in for a well-timed strike that stops the violence, avoid any hits from Croc or Bane, then fall back and continue the debris dodge. This happens four times until, uh-oh, there's a sewer waterfall. Robin comes to, having pulled himself to the surface, but Bane and Croc are nowhere to be seen. The sound of gunfire echoes in the distance. The player rushes out of the sewer to find they've washed up in the narrows. Killer Croc's men have managed to link up with him and are exchanging gunfire with false face society goons in the streets. Croc is pretty injured, but roars out a demand Bane come out and face him, or he's gonna tear his location out of his men's throats. Robin recognizes the need to prioritize saving lives first, then he can take on Croc. Luckily, most of the row houses in this area are condemned and vacant. There should only be a few unfortunate souls caught in the area. The player needs to go from house to house, stealthily taking out goons positioned inside and clear the way for the civilians to flee while the war is still raging in the streets. In the fifth house, the player clears out the goons and goes to tell a teenager to leave, but he pulls a pistol on Robin. He's got a tough face on, but his arms are shaking. He hesitates, and the player disarms him, pinning the kid against a wall. Robin asks how old he's supposed to be. 
14, too young to be playing with guns and gangsters. Trust me. Robin tackles the boy out of the way as a bullet fires into the room. Killer Croc's goons have made Robin's position. He's shouting for his men to swarm the little bird and kill him. He can handle Cyanus's two-bit hoods on his own. Robin tells the boy to stay hidden, and this building turns into a three-story predator challenge where the player needs to clear out two dozen goons. Robin then returns to the boy and tells him to get out of here, to run as far away as he can. Wait, he pauses. When did the gunfire stop? Croc's hand bursts out of the floor and grabs Robin's foot. Robin pushes the teenager back before he's dragged down by Croc, who sticks Robin's head in his mouth. The player is prompted to throw a smoke pellet down his throat, causing Croc to cough. He throws Robin through a wall and out onto the street, where Black Mask's men lay defeated. We got ourselves another boss fight between Robin and Killer Croc in the streets of Gotham City. The terrain consists of tight alleyways, makeshift barricades, abandoned cars, and run-down roadways. Killer Croc is injured from his battle, but he's still a force to be reckoned with. The player needs to use the environment to their advantage, avoiding Croc while he hunts for them, leading Croc into traps that momentarily stun him so the player can fly in to deal some damage with Robin's mighty fists. Repeat until Croc is finally down for the count. Standing triumphantly over Croc's limp body, Robin smirks. Holy crap. I actually did it. Then the teenager rushes out to him and thanks him for saving his life. He's not with Black Mask's crew, they just busted into his home and stuck a gun in his face, telling him to shoot anything that moves. Robin looks to the building and back to the boy, and asks if he lives there alone. The boy says that he does, but he doesn't mind. He knows how to get by on his own. Police sirens echo, and the boy gets skittish. Robin places a hand on his shoulder and tells him his secret is safe. If he's ever in any trouble, he can always rely on him. The kid tells him he always liked Robin more than Batman, which makes Dick smile. Robin hands him one of his shuriken and tells him he's officially been deputized, but he better not see that thing in any pawn shop windows. The teenager thanks him and runs off, leaving Robin to contend with the swarm of police led by Rene Montoya. The player swooshes across Gotham to take control of Batgirl for some free roam time. Thanks to the intel from Poison Ivy, she knows to check out Gotham's Gallery of Wax to pick up the trail on Mother in her search for Gordon. Once the player gets there, they sneak inside through the ventilation system and drop down amongst the wax statues of famous historical and DC Comics characters. The exhibit is closed for the evening, but Batgirl's detective vision is picking up a tremendous amount of energy being siphoned off to the basement. As the player walks through, Batgirl remarks that this is already creepy enough, but it appears that the wax figures may be moving when they're not in view. The player is sprung upon by a small army of orphans hidden amongst the figures who need to be beaten. Then, the exhibit of a typical 1950s nuclear family lights up. Inside stands Mother, cradling a wax baby in her arms. She wants to know what happened to Batman. Batgirl says, very funny. Mother isn't laughing. You confirm what you think I already know, and I'll let you have the Scarecrow. I'll find him on my own. You're looking for the Commissioner. Batgirl flinches. Yes, I recognize the dread, the last gasp of hope before the memory that lasts forever. I will tell you about your Commissioner if you do as Mother asks. Batgirl tells her that Prometheus set a trap for Batman. He's at the Crooked House, Willowwood. The doctor is beneath the film history exhibit. He's outlived his usefulness to me, but maybe you'll kill each other. The light goes out, and Mother fades from view. Batgirl hesitates. Torn between her desire to save her father and the mission, she goes after Scarecrow. The player eventually finds a trap door in a section of the exhibit that looks an awful lot like the Wizard of Oz. It leads into the lower levels where the spare and deformed wax figures are kept. There also just so happens to be a secret lab where Scarecrow and a handful of other nursery scientists are running experiments on kidnapped victims in oversized test tubes. The player gets the drop on two of them, but the other scientists activate the tubes while Scarecrow pushes through them to escape. The containers open, releasing a cloud of white mist and the people inside. The scientists are confident these prototype neo-orphans are more than enough to take down a little girl. There are 13 Batgirl has to fend off single-handedly, including bashing the remaining scientists. Batgirl is left with a hollow victory. Mother escaped, Scarecrow escaped, she has more questions than answers, but she did get the one answer she was looking for. She knows where to find her dad. It's unclear to her why Mother would betray Prometheus, or why Ivy would betray Mother for that matter, 
but she feels it was sincere and calls Detective Bullock. Time for another switcheroo over to Robin. He's recovered from his adventure through sewers and slums and wrapped up his discussion with Renee Montoya when he gets a call from an overjoyed Alfred. Bruce is awake. He's still in bad shape, but he's finally conscious. Robin is ecstatic and tells Alfred he'll be home soon, then hangs up. Now, he's on the hunt for Bane. Somehow, someway, Bane disappeared after his Whitewater Rapids battle with Croc. He was nowhere to be found in the Narrows battle, and Robin theorizes that he must have been hurt. There's no way Bane would run away. So, it's up to the player to pick up Bane's trail, starting off with what's suspected to be his blood. Robin even goes so far as to match the sample he found against the blood type they have on file. The player tracks his blood trail a good way until it goes cold, ending in a large pool of blood with one of Killer Croc's teeth swimming in it. Not to worry, because the player finds a splash of venom nearby, which Robin isolates to track traces of the substance through the air. This leads the player to an abandoned wrestling venue, and Robin wonders what Bane could be doing here. Just looking to recover somewhere quiet? As Robin steps into the ring, the light goes on, and Bane leaps from the shadows, but the player flips out of the way. Bane grumbles that the Cocodrillo did more damage than he had planned. Monsters always evolving. Robin's happy to give him a band-aid, maybe a kiss to make it feel better? Bane charges and the player flips out of the way once again, spinning around to attack, but Bane is gone. A steel cage falls around the ring. I was hoping both his little sidekicks would come. Is the girl too afraid to face the one who defeated Batman? Robin retorts they agreed Bane was a problem only one little sidekick could handle. How about we skip the part where I embarrass you and you open the cage now? Bane thinks not. He's been away for a long time. He owes his men some entertainment. Last night he broke the bat. Tonight the bird. Tomorrow the girl. That's right ladies and gentlemen, we've got ourselves a cage match. In one corner we've got the boy wonder, and in the other we've got about seven rounds of obstacles, goons, and forced limitations on gameplay mechanics. The bulk of this level takes place in this rigged up ring. The first wave is a simple enough goon bashathon. the second is where venom enhanced thugs make their comeback, the third is where the cage becomes electrified, and the goons are equipped with guns. The fourth is a giant mix of the first three. The fifth is where a ragged and unmasked scarecrow is forced into the ring, wielding a scythe coated in fear toxin. A little backstory is given through dialogue by Bane and Scarecrow. Bane's men snag Scarecrow fleeing the gallery of wax. Bane had been planning to betray Prometheus all along. He didn't expect to do it this soon, but after learning about the Bruja backing him, her true motives and methods, he was disgusted. Scarecrow was a key player in her vile deeds, so he is the first to be punished. After the Bat family is destroyed, Bane will shift his attention to Prometheus, then any other fools who stand before him, finally dominating Gotham. Scarecrow points out the irony in his own capture. He was fleeing mother who had already betrayed him. He was a loose end, no longer necessary to her plans. That's all to say, Scarecrow acts as a mini-boss. Any damage the player takes from his scythe creates a minor fear toxin effect in the world momentarily. As Scarecrow is defeated, he manages to slice off Robin's utility belt, which Bane's men promptly snag out of the ring. Round 6 has to be done without any gadgets at all, and hosts the largest count of enemies up to that point. Then finally, round 7 is the title match. An infuriated and arrogant Bane steps into the ring to kill Robin himself. How does Robin overcome him? Welp, with some quick thinking. The player has no hope of dealing enough damage to take Bane out with just Robin's bare fists, but there are a few options to inflict regular damage to his health bar, such as dodging out of the way so he collides into the electrified cage, or other environmental factors, and special takedown moves. However, the real way the player defeats Bane is by using Scarecrow's scythe. Robin doesn't have any tools to sever Bane's venom supply, but by snagging Scarecrow's discarded and poisoned blade, He's more than evened the odds. Once Bane's health is lowered enough, he'll rage out and start brutalizing the environment, smashing the ring and stomping the ground, then he'll lash out at the player with a volley of fists. If the player can avoid being hit, they'll be prompted to sever one of Bane's tubes with the scythe. This needs to be done three times to win. However, 
Each time this happens, a little bit of fear toxin gets pumped directly into Bane's system. This causes him to rage out more and more as he faces his fears, which makes each bout against him more fast-paced and deadly than the last. Bane is ultimately defeated in a finisher that sees Robin using his strength and size against him to set himself free. Bane is flung into the cage, smashing a hole in it and bringing it toppling down. What goons remain in the stands flee for their lives. Robin stands triumphant. The bird is free from the cage. He's proven what he had to prove to himself tonight and smiles. Switching over to Batgirl, she's finished her conversation with Bullock and the players prompted to make their way to Gordon's location on the outskirts of Gotham, arriving at the Willowwood Home for Children, an orphanage abandoned a decade ago after it was swallowed up by a sinkhole. Now it stands half consumed, jutting crookedly out of the earth. Batgirl remarks that she can't wait for Bullock's backup, she needs to move fast, but just can't barge in and risk Gordon getting killed. The player needs to find an entry point, sneak inside, and assess the situation. This is a dilapidated building, long forgotten, and it wasn't exactly in peak condition before it sunk into the earth. The building is constructed out of dark, splintering wood. Batgirl remembers rumors she heard in school after Willowwood sunk, the alleged abuses the children suffered. All urban legend, she tells herself. It's not long until Batgirl thinks she's found Gordon. She hears muffled screams and the player runs into a room to find a GCPD officer tied up and gagged in a filthy, moldy bed. Just then, a voice crackles through the house. Stay on guard! The little bats are searching for this place. We cannot disappoint Prometheus. The voice is Black Masks, but where is it coming from? Oh crap. The player is prompted to grapple into the rafters as a false face society goon rounds the corner. He responds into his walkie-talkie that the first floor is secure, then turns to a buddy and asks when Black Mask and this Prometheus guy became best friends. Weren't we planning on betraying him yesterday? Beats me. The boss man is… eccentric. Probably got offered a better deal. The player reassesses their surroundings. Turns out, this isn't just where Prometheus is keeping Gordon, but a number of other police officers he's kidnapped throughout the day. There are Harvey Bullock's missing people. Before proceeding after Gordon, the player must go throughout two levels of this building and stealthily take out all the goons and secure the hostages. In the middle of it, Batgirl informs Bullock, who is setting up a perimeter that the released hostages quietly sneak outside to. Once that's through, only one hostage remains. Up on the third floor, Black Mask is guarding Commissioner Gordon, who is set up in a chair overlooking the city out a large round window. There's no way around it, Batgirl is gonna have to confront Black Mask head on to get to her father. The player enters the room and Black Mask is furious. His eyes are glowing pure white. If my men aren't already dead, when I'm through with you, they will be. Black Mask charges at the player. He's stronger than normal. The collision sends the player skidding backward. He says he's been embraced by Prometheus, he's been reborn, and feels indebted to him. AKA, he's been exposed to trauma toxin and is under Prometheus's control. A number of orphans emerge to reinforce him, setting the stage for a fight over Commissioner Gordon with Black Mask as mini-boss. Once that's handled, Batgirl goes to untie Gordon, but her side is riddled with tranquilizer darts. Prometheus drops down from the rafters, amused at how easily this city's symbols of justice collapse although he laments the quality of its villains as he steps over Black Mask. He couldn't leave for an hour to kidnap more cops without losing an entire houseful. Welp, once he's done with the do-gooders, he'll work on establishing a higher class of criminal. Prometheus lunges at the player, who barely has control over Batgirl. Her movements are delayed, and one side of her body is limp. All the player can do is parry and evade. Prometheus is toying with them. In the process, he asks when Batman will be back. After all, he's put in a lot of work kidnapping all these cops for him. His body may be broken, but that spirit of his is a tougher nut to crack. Hopefully, watching an entire house filled with cops burn to the ground will prove that everything he's ever done hasn't made the slightest difference in this city. After a moment, Prometheus will grow bored of beating Batgirl and go to execute a fatal strike on the tied-up Gordon. The player manages to intercept Prometheus, and in the process, snags his detonation device. However, Batgirl is left vulnerable to a lethal blow. Prometheus smiles. This is when Harvey Bullock busts in, firing a semi-automatic shotgun at Prometheus, who is forced to evade out of the way. Bullock damns the son of a bitch, and tells Batgirl to get the commish out of here right away. 
the player grabs Gordon and shatters the window with explosive gel, just as Bullock is shot. An ungagged Gordon shouts out to him as Prometheus fires a second round into Bullock. The fatter the pig, the more satisfying the kill. He turns his gun on Gordon and Batgirl, but the player detonates the device, the force of which sends the Gordons out the window and sets the house on fire. Batgirl crashes onto the ground below with Gordon in her arms as cop cars arrive on the scene. Gordon is devastated, Prometheus is nowhere to be found, Batgirl stares into the flames. Fade to black. Fade in on Batman, perched on a gargoyle on the old clock tower as it strikes midnight. Surveying the city, he spots a younger Robin, the same character model from the previous game, down on the rooftops below. The player takes control, chasing after him, all the while the ticking of the clock continues in Batman's ear. The player is unable to catch up to Robin no matter how fast they move. He just keeps pushing forward until eventually vanishing out of sight. The clock strikes midnight once more with a flash, and suddenly Batman stands alone under a spotlight in the lobby of the Royal Hotel, decorated for Christmas. Every supervillain and mini-boss Batman's fought throughout his career come out of the surrounding darkness. Robin drops down by Batman's side, and the player takes control in a dual-team bash-a-thon where these villains are taken down like regular goons. Robin is laughing and cracking jokes, Batman even plays along with the banter. Once all the villains are down, the spotlight grows brighter. Enormous specters of Prometheus and Mother tower in the sky above like gods. Batman turns to Robin, who begins soaring upward into the sky. He tells Batman not to worry, he's got this. Batman calls after Robin as he vanishes into the bright light. Suddenly, all the downed villains get back up, their broken limbs snapping back into place. The player has to fight them all again, but none stay down permanently, and the light grows dimmer throughout the fight. Batman calls out to Robin, asking if he's okay, begging to know what's going on. Eventually, the player is overwhelmed by the villains and pinned to the ground. The clock strikes midnight once more, and Robin falls from the sky. His broken body lands before an immobile Batman. He's dead. Bruce Wayne shoots awake in the Batcave. Alfred rushes over and thanks the Lord. Bruce is thrashing, discombobulated. Alfred manages to calm him down, telling him he's safe, he's home. Bruce looks around and asks how the others are doing. Cut to some time later. Bruce is conscious and active, although he's still bedridden. Alfred is on the communicator with Batgirl. It's clear they just got word about Bullock's death. Bruce is furious. He should have been there. Alfred tells Batgirl to get some rest and hangs up as Dick enters the cave with a big smile. He's happy to see Bruce is awake and is riding high from his night on the town. Bruce is cold. He asks Dick what he's been doing while Barbara was on her own. Alfred interjects, telling Bruce he needs to take it easy. As he already told him, Master Richard was dealing with other matters. Harvey Bullock has been killed, Bruce says. What? Prometheus shot him while Barbara rescued Jim. It was too high a cost. This is no game. You think I don't know that? I just took down Bane. The Bane. I think you were a fool to take Bane on without backup. You can't be serious. I get vengeance for you against the man who put you in that bed. Shouldn't you be, I don't know, grateful or God forbid proud? You can't do this on your own. Hate to tell you this, Bruce, but I just did. And all that gets me is a lecture. Bruce begins to sit up. Stay down, Alfred commands. Dick, please. Now is not the time. Bruce pushes Alfred's hand off his chest and continues to stand. He staggers over to Dick, then suddenly strikes out against him. As Dick, the player is prompted to counter, but the strike lands. Lazy, Bruce shouts. Dick recoils, asking what he's doing. Bruce strikes out again, the player is prompted to counter, but another strike lands. Bad form. As Bruce gears up for another strike, Dick lowers his hands. He takes the next one in the gut. Soft, Bruce exhales collapsing onto his knees. Looking up at Dick, he says, you're not ready to leave. Dick glances over at Alfred, who is mortified, then looks down at Bruce. You just gave me a reason to. He storms out of the cave. Alfred picks Bruce up off the floor and tells him he certainly knows how to make an ass of himself in front of that boy. Bruce tells Alfred, no bed. He's rested too long. 
He wants to be brought to his workbench. Gotham has become too dangerous. He can't let anyone else die. He can't let anyone else put themselves in harm's way because he's too weak. Alfred tells him he's mad. In his condition, it's a miracle he's even standing. Bruce insists that his injuries won't stop him from protecting this city. He begins tinkering with the limb reinforcement equipment from the last game, the kind used for his broken arm. It's time I become the knight. It's the dawning of a new day. The sound of metal clanging fills the darkness, then what emerges from the shadows sparks a look of terror on Alfred's face. Bruce Wayne has donned a new armored and mechanical batsuit. He's ready for war. I'm picturing this suit to be somewhat comparable to a blend of the Dark Knight Returns armored suit, the Kingdom Come suit, and the Asriel Nightfall suit. The point is, it should be noticeably more intimidating. For the sake of convenience, let's call it the Knight Suit. With it, he's able to do everything he usually can, and more. His strength and speed are slightly amplified, and he's got a few new and refreshed gizmos hidden up his robo-sleeves. Alfred compliments Bruce's engineering mind, but insists he's doing too much too soon. The suit is untested, and if something were to go wrong in the field, Batman interjects, not wanting to hear it. He's heading out to finally bring this city back under control. Alfred says he'll alert Master Richard and Miss Gordon, but Batman tells him not to bother. There's no need to put anyone else in danger. He can protect them all on his own. The player takes off into Gotham City with this new, and improved, Batman. With the pact taken out by Robin and Batgirl, and no word on Ivy, Mother, or Prometheus, there's no immediate main mission to tackle. Instead, the player is required to complete any three side missions before proceeding with the main campaign. It's been a while since the player got to play as Batman, and now they get to take this new suit out for a spin for a prolonged period of time. This allows Batman to bring the city under control, and all side missions available to him are built with specific dialogue changes if Night Batman shows up versus regular Batman. Once those missions are completed, Batman gets a call from Alfred. Warden Quincy Sharp has been kidnapped by the Joker. According to police chatter, they were last spotted at the My Alibi nightclub. The player heads to the scene of the crime and meets up with none other than Commissioner Gordon, who is already canvassing the area. A squad of street demons are being hauled off in handcuffs by supporting officers. When Gordon sees Batman, there's a momentary silence. An unspoken understanding about Bullock lingers between them. Gordon says, nice suit, and the player begins investigating the scene with Gordon at their back. He says eyewitnesses place the Joker and, quote, some bald, disgusting creep at the bar drinking together. Joker suddenly killed the bartender and all hell broke loose. The player searches for any clue that could lead to his next location as Gordon fills Batman in. This nightclub is a street demon's operation. The head of the demons and the head of the low boys were having a sit down in the back room trying to negotiate the end of a gang war. When the Joker chaos broke out, each accused the other of setting a trap. The gangs are now out for blood. Batman tells Gordon that wasn't the Joker's intention. The player spots blood from the bartender pooled around the top liquor shelf where one bottle is missing. The player grabs a neighboring bottle to isolate the alcoholic compound with detective vision, forming a trail through the air. Batman tells Gordon that Joker was merely stealing booze, which surprises the commissioner. So what's his plan? Batman says he's not sure. He's acting uncharacteristically erratic, which is saying something. He's going after him, he'll keep Gordon informed. The player follows the trail across town to a bar called The Stacked Deck, a low boys operation that people are fleeing out of and enters into the middle of a shootout between street demons and low boys. The player needs to take down all these thugs and then investigates what the hell Joker was doing here. Batman has second thoughts that maybe Joker is trying to stir something up between these gangs, but then, the player finds Warden Sharp's wallet, which has been emptied of all cash. A crime scene reconstruction reveals that Joker forced Sharp into the bar at gunpoint, then they were immediately held up and one low boy fired a warning shot into the wall beside Joker. Joker pulled out all Sharp's money to clarify he was just there to have a few drinks. That's when the street demons attacked. In the chaos, Joker shot two low boys and made off with another bottle, fleeing out the back door. The trail continues with a different liquor to a Big Belly Burger drive through where the Joker is holding up the cashier window at gunpoint, with Quincy Sharp strapped to the passenger seat. Upon spotting Batman, Joker peels out, and the player has to keep up with his manic drunk driving. All the while, Joker complains to a gagged Sharp. 
What's revealed is that Joker's on a depressed, out-of-work, single dad bender. Without Harley and his junior, he's trying to cope with a night on the town with his best friend, Quincy Sharp. Of course, Batman had to show up and spoil it. The chase leads the player all the way back home to Arkham Asylum. On the singular street leading to the Arkham grounds, the player descends onto the roof of Joker's car and uses Batman's new strength to tear the top clean off. Batman tries to snag Joker, but he begins firing an oversized pistol wildly, forcing the player to retreat in fear he'll kill Sharp. Joker crashes the car straight into the psych ward, then stumbles out with Quincy Sharp in tow. Batman goes to pursue, but from the street behind, the street demons and low boys sweet hogs roar onto the scene. They've come to an understanding and are here to kill the clown and the bat. The player needs to bash them all real good, a display of Batman's brutal efficiency in this suit, then rush after the Joker. Inside the psych ward, the player passes many guards and doctors who have been beaten and maimed along the path toward maximum security. Batman wonders what on earth Joker is after. Once the player reaches the maximum security ward, they find Quincy Sharp with a wire around his neck, connected to Joker's pistol in a sort of pulley. Sharp's ensnared, and if he moves too much, the trigger will be pulled, blasting his head to bits. The player deactivates the trap, and Sharp collapses onto the floor. He's been reduced to a puddle of sniveling cowardice and righteous, vitriolic hatred. The player leaves him, rounding the corner into intensive treatment, where they find a Joker sitting in his cell. He's locked himself back up. The player approaches as Joker asks, What kind of best friend lets you drive drunk? I suppose I'm to blame. I tried to be a good man, a family man, and look what it's gotten me. Look where it's gotten you. Look at what it's done to your fashion sense. Why try and change? We had a good thing going, just the two of us, didn't we? From outside the cell, Batman grips the bars, asking if Joker expects him to believe his little story. The player pries the door open, but Joker doesn't flinch. He tells Batman to believe what he'd like. He certainly does. But he recognizes his attitude. He feels the same way himself. Batman reeks of desperation, and that's just not funny. They're no good for each other like this. Joker will wait things out and rest at home for a while. Batman grabs him by the collar, raises his fist, then tosses the Joker aside and slams the cell door shut behind him. Joker watches silently as Batman departs. A slight smile creeps up his lips. The player swaps to controlling Robin out in Gotham City for some free roam. Straight away, it's clear that he's upset. He's stuck on his conversation with Bruce. He feels a desire to prove himself to him. What's the best way to do that? By taking down Prometheus. So, the next main mission begins when the player heads to the new GCPD headquarters to speak with Riddler. No more games, he's gonna shake him down for everything he knows. Once inside, the player finds that the Riddler is missing. He's escaped. But why? Robin asks as the player chases down his trail, leading to the infirmary where Riddler is about to stab an unconscious black mask to death. The player stops him, bringing Riddler down and pinning him to a wall in the hallway. It turns out this was Riddler's true scheme. He was hired by Penguin to assassinate Black Mask. The best way Riddler thought to do that was by having the Bat Family bring Black Mask to him. Welp, now Robin's got the leverage he needs. He threatens Riddler. If he doesn't give him everything he knows about the nursery, then he can't stop word from spreading that Riddler's a snitch. That he's the reason all the supervillains, who he's definitely heading back to Arkham with, got caught. Riddler squeals the one bit of information he's been holding back. He knows where Poison Ivy's been hiding, the cave in Robinson Park. The player takes off, leaving Riddler in police custody. A brief aside about side missions, any not yet assigned by Riddler prior to this point will be assigned by Quiz and Query going forward. On the way to the park, Robin gets a call from Batgirl. She just heard from Alfred, she can't believe Batman's back on the streets already, but then again, so is her dad, even after she begged him to take one night off. She asks how Bruce is doing, and Robin tells her to ask him herself. Jeez, sore subject? Where are you now? Robin tells her, and she says she'll come along. He says he wants to do this on his own. She asks if he's crazy. What's the point in that when she's free and willing to help? She's coming, 
end of discussion. The player arrives in Robinson Park and is met by Batgirl, who the player can now switch to whenever they'd like. Turns out, the cave in Robinson Park runs so deep that it connects to the subway system. The pair uncover an underground lair filled with a nursery of plants fed with artificial light. Riddler wasn't lying. This is where Ivy has made home. As the heroes get deeper into the lair, the plants get crazier, becoming obstacles to overcome and enemies to defeat, ending with a final plant boss encounter before arriving at Ivy's inner sanctum. Here, the player does some detective work complete with everyone's favorite audio logs. Throughout this sequence, we get a ton of juicy information. A hand-drawn map of Arkham Island revealing the cave system they used in the breakout, blueprints for the device Batgirl saw Ivy's puppets gathering parts for at Galaxy Broadcasting, and the layout for Babylon Towers, a glorified gated community for Gotham's uber elite made from four skyscrapers in the heart of the new section of the city added for this game. It feels like it's coming out of nowhere in my description, but in the context of having explored the open world in the game, these buildings will be very familiar to the player by this point. All the while, the audio logs play. The player hears Ivy's plans dating back to the aftermath of Arkham Bonds, tying into that game's epilogue. Ivy's goal is to control the citizens of Babylon Towers, the rich and powerful of Gotham, and manipulate them into doing her bidding, donating and enacting programs for the benefit of the environment while destroying their industries. The issue she faced was her limited power, unable to control her victims out of a certain proximity. Welp, Mother can help with that. The audio logs chronicle how Ivy met Mother and Ivy's first impressions of Prometheus. They're the ones who helped her escape from Blackgate, and Mother's nursery scientists designed a machine that would enhance the effect of Ivy's spores, all in exchange for Ivy contributing her unique pheromones to Mother's cause, to help in the creation of a new trauma toxin. The logs also reveal Ivy's role in the Arkham Breakout, the aftermath when Mother and Prometheus showed their true colors, Ivy's realization about Mother's ideal victims, and what happened after the assassination attempt on her. She saw it as an opportunity, and contacted the League of Assassins. Ivy has sold out Mother, setting a trap at the site where her scheme is set to kick off, Babylon Towers. The League of Assassins have accepted this deal, agreeing to spare Ivy and allow her plan to continue unimpeded. Raish is quite sympathetic to it. Boom. So the heroes need to head to Babylon Towers, but they're going to be the last ones to the party. Everything is set to come to a head any minute. Batgirl goes to call Batman, but Robin tells her they don't need him. She insists, saying this isn't a game, and Robin snaps out of his resentment and agrees. Batgirl tells him something she's noticed in Bruce that she doesn't want to see Dick adopt. Just because you can be on your own doesn't mean you should be. Cut to Batman soaring across the Gotham skyline in his badass armor. He gets a call from Batgirl, who he immediately tells to take the night off. She ignores that and alerts him to the Babylon Tower situation. He thanks them for gathering this intel, but he'll take it from here. Batgirl scoffs and says they'll see him soon. The player is prompted to head to Babylon Towers for the final series of missions. It's at this point the all too familiar no going back message pops up. Then. It's finale time. Babylon Towers consists of four large skyscrapers, the next one taller than the last, each with a distinct look and personality. On the third highest tower, or second shortest depending on your perspective, is where the player needs to go because, uh oh, that's where there's an open battle between orphans and league ninjas. The player blasts in there and starts kicking ass. The objective is to tear through all these enemy types in a massive battle royale across towers 3, 2, and 1, showing off Batman's speed and power, until finally coming upon Mother on the highest tower, standing beside the dispersal device. She wanted so badly to nurture Dr. Isley, but she suspected she was too fragile to understand what needed to be done. Her betrayal was expected from the start, so Mother had a failsafe built into the device. It works quite well with her new and improved trauma toxin. If Batman gets any closer, she'll activate it. Or has he come around to take her up on her offer? It's not too late. All he needs to do is nothing. Batman marches forward, knowing the weakness of her toxin and why this wouldn't have been her plan from the start. Mother needs to imprint upon her victims. A mass dispersal of her toxin will create imperfect orphans. Mother says that her trauma does work far better on the malleable minds of children, as he well knows. 
but this plan B will do in a pinch. She goes to activate the device when her finger is sliced clean off. A thrown blade sticks into the ground beside Batman. Talia al Ghul lunges from the shadows at Mother, who merely looks at her finger with half interest. The player is prompted to intercept Talia, but as the two collide, they break off to avoid incoming gunfire and skid to the side of the building. Prometheus appears, holding Mother's bloodied hand in his. She thanks him for showing up, rubbing her visor with her bloodied hand, worried he had abandoned her for good. Prometheus says he owed her for all she taught him, but this is his last act of loyalty. Mother shrieks in angered protest, saying he can't leave her, she made him. Prometheus hurls her from the rooftop. Just then, Poison Ivy's vines burst through the building and ensnare the device, carrying it away. Talia flees to find more stable ground, but the player charges past Prometheus and after Mother, leaping off the side to save her. The player catches Mother, who lashes out, trying to claw and stab at Batman as they pseudo-glide through the window of the neighboring tower's lower level. Batman is momentarily incapacitated, which provides enough time for orphans to arrive and escort a limping Mother out of the area, while a good number stay back to face Batman. However, as the player squares off to fight them, the orphans are quickly slaughtered by Talia al Ghul from the shadows who then stands before an angered Batman. The two face off for a fight. Meanwhile, we cut to Batgirl and Robin's perspective as they arrive at the scene. The pair stop on a neighboring skyscraper and see the chaos of the last moment unfold. Ivy's vines, Mother tossed from the rooftop, Batman descending after her. There's too much going on for them to stay together, so Batgirl is going after the device, while Robin is going to apprehend Mother once and for all. For now, the player sticks with Batgirl. They need to plummet through the debris cloud emanating from the top tower, until coming to a halt atop the shortest of the four towers, where Ivy has just finished inserting a massive vial of swirling green and pink mist into the device. It's been activated. Ivy's spores spread throughout the air as Batgirl straps her oxygen mask around her nose and mouth. Swarms of high-class puppets rise from inside the skyscraper to join them on the rooftop, while Ivy is transformed by the cloud of her enhanced spores. Her voice changes thunderous and terrifying, like a vengeful god. She decrees that although humans may have once worked against Mother Nature, all past transgressions will be forgiven in Ivy's paradise. Though, those who still resist will not be spared. She commands her puppets to protect the device and to kill Batgirl. The player must fight off this horde, which requires the same damage as a standard orphan. When the first wave is through, Ivy summons a host of plants from the Earth, which consume the tower and reshape the arena. For this next wave, the opponents are enhanced, given some basic control over plant life, which means they can use vine whip attacks like Ivy from the boss fight in the asylum, except much more limited in range and without the poison factor. Speaking of poison, Batgirl's mask isn't living up to the task. As the second round goes on, the spores begin seeping in, and tinges of the warm, pink, and happy filter from that first asylum fight seep into the world. Once the player defeats the second round, it's on to the main event. Ivy has been seduced by her unexpected newfound power. She's Queen Ivy now, and will reshape the world in her image. She taunts Batgirl, saying that when she finally bends to her queen's will, she can give up her foolish crusade and become an agent of true justice. Or her blood can fertilize her children. Ivy coats herself in a thick layer of bark armor, doubling in size, and strikes out at the player. The name of the game here is Survival. This armored ivy has bark that's too durable for Batgirl to do significant damage with her fists alone. However, in Ivy's delusions of godhood, she's gotten less protective of the device. So, the player has to survive this boss encounter, largely avoiding Ivy and momentarily stunning her. There will be waves of goons to take down, each wave ends with the player temporarily trapping Ivy long enough to do critical damage to the device. This happens three times until it's finally destroyed. Once the fight is through, Ivy lashes out in anger as she feels control and power slipping away. With her final bit of strength, she tries to smash Batgirl, but misses and caves in the rooftop, sending Ivy and Batgirl tumbling down several stories. They lay beside each other, pretty banged up in the rubble, but Batgirl is the first to get up. She asks if Ivy wants to go another round, but Ivy stays down. She barely manages to get out a whisper, but manages to say that it's up to Batgirl to protect them. Batgirl says she isn't watering any plants, but with Ivy's last bit of strength, she uses her powers to unseal a door, 
revealing a room filled with young children she's hidden away. Mother's still out there. Don't let her rip them out by the root. Ivy goes unconscious. Batgirl is stunned. The children slowly come closer to her, and she takes charge, telling them it's going to be okay. She knows the way out of here. Let's go find your parents. We catch back up with Batman, about to face Talia al Ghul. She blames him for Mother getting away. All he had to do was let her fall, but he couldn't let nature run its course. Prometheus knew Batman would save Mother. That was the quickest way to get her away from the League. Now she's escaped, and they've missed their best chance at killing her. Batman's foolishness will cost him his life. Spare me the lecture. Batman charges at Talia, who disappears in a puff of smoke. Hidden in shadow, she tells Batman she's no fool. She knows she's outmatched in a head-on duel with him hidden inside that machine. What are you hiding from, detective? The shadow of Robin glides across the area and vanishes. Time for a stealth boss battle against the Daughter of the Demon. I'm picturing this playing out like a reverse Arkham City Freeze boss battle, where Batman is in the position of Freeze and Talia in the position of Batman. The player will need to be constantly on guard to counter traps or sneak attacks, then discern how such an attack was executed and neutralize what's available in the environment so that it cannot be done again. If the player is clever enough, they can even set traps within traps. Talia thinks she's got the drop on the player, but they've preemptively set up a counter to do damage that will affect her health in the second round of the conflict. It's a little complicated to explain, but I think if pulled off right, it would be deeply satisfying and feel very Batman. This is a terrible example, but think about preemptively booby-trapping the exterior of a vent that Talia may strike from with explosive gel. Throughout the boss counter, Talia is berating Batman about how similar he is to Mother a fickle ally too absorbed with gazing at their own navel to appreciate the bigger picture. Mother betrayed Raish at the first sign of weakness, willing to take a payday from an inferior organization like Hive. Talia provides more details of Mother's backstory. She's the sole survivor of a village in Gardavia, a nation that no longer exists due to a terrible siege at the tail end of the Cold War. Her friends and family were butchered before her eyes, but she strengthened herself with that trauma then wanted to share it with others. A crippled, broken thing selling the cure. Too stubborn to ask for help, but desperate for support. Confident and content, cut off from the world, yet so vulnerable to the smallest perceived affront. Mother frightened Talia as a child, as a bat might frighten another. The difference between you and me, detective, is that I'm not afraid of anything anymore. After the player has successfully cut off all methods of stealth attack for Talia, she will leap from her hiding position shouting, your fear drives the boy away, making you weak to mother's promises. She strikes in a continuous barrage reminiscent of their first encounter earlier in the game, which the player must block. Talia goes to sweep Batman's leg, but the player flips over her and disarms her, sending her skidding back with a punch to the gut. Mother's offer never appealed to me. She never understood, and neither do you. Understand what? It's here that the player engages Talia in a round of close quarters combat, similar to Shiva and Nissa's fights from earlier in the game, although Talia is notably faster than either of them and has a greater, slightly different arsenal. Any damage inflicted to Talia during the stealth round will carry over here. The fight ends after the player has bashed Talia up real good, and Batman has her pinned to the wall. You've proven your strength, Bruce. Talia lunges in for a kiss. It lingers for a moment before he tosses her aside. She uses the opportunity to vanish into a puff of smoke. Batman is left disoriented, then catches a glimpse of the broken bat signal flying high above the Gotham skyline. For the next mission, the player picks up where they left off with Robin, searching for Mother in the chaos of Babylon Towers. As the player heads toward where Batman landed with Mother, Robin sees that she's escaped, and Talia is engaging Batman. The player is prompted to crash through a ventilation shaft on the side of the tower to discreetly pick up Mother's trail. Blood from her severed finger drips along the floor, leading down an elevator shaft out to a parking garage where the player picks up tire tracks and follows them on their bat cycle all the way to the soon to be opened Martha Wayne Memorial Children's Hospital. The player barges into the hospital, but finds nothing. It's dark. Grand opening signs litter the colorful, child-friendly lobby. The blood trail is back. It leads the player down a hallway toward the only light source flickering at the end. Halfway down, a child appears in the doorway, silhouetted by the flickering light. Robin calls out to him to come over, 
but the child turns and runs out of sight. The player gives chase, entering what appears to be an operation room. The child is not here. Instead, he is down another hallway, seen briefly before slipping out of sight again. The player continues their chase, which leads them down a playroom filled with mangled toys, a makeshift classroom with several desks and a yardstick sprinkled with blood, and what appears at first to be a kennel, until the player takes a closer look and sees the dolls and action figures in the cages. Off to the side, the boy has stopped in the center of another dimly lit room. The player enters, and the eight-year-old boy looks up at him with white, pupilless eyes. Robin flinches back in surprise, but is beset upon by two orphans from behind. The player needs to take them out, and once that's done, Robin asks if the boy is okay. The player is prompted to dodge a small knife aimed at Robin's throat. Recognizing that this boy is fully under the control of Mother, but not wanting to harm him, the player is prompted to encase him with their glue grenade gadget. The boy is incapacitated, but shrieks out, threatening to kill Robin if he goes anywhere near his mother. At this, the rest of the lights in the room flicker on row by row, revealing more children watching Robin patiently. The walls are lined with empty, tube-shaped chambers with white mist spilling out onto the floor. When the final row of lights turn on, Mother is revealed to be among them. She clutches her hand, blood running down her arms, and says, I was going to take my harvest to Jump City, but how can I leave you in your condition? My new toxin can solve your imperfections. Batman stole my son, now I'll take his. The Neo-Orphan children charge at Robin. They are feral, steadfast in their loyalty and dedication to Mother, ready to die for her at the drop of a hat. The player needs to avoid all the incoming damage while gluing them up. When that's done, the player charges at Mother, but they are unable to close the gap. The room stretches on infinitely. Robin stops, realizing what has happened as the floor gives out beneath him, and he is consumed by swirling darkness. Mother's cackle fills the void, as young Dick Grayson crashes through the big tent of Haley's circus, where the mangled, broken bodies of his parents lay spotlighted on the floor. Their corpses rise off the ground and grow until they reach the heights of the trapeze. Glaring down at Dick with lifeless, bloodied eyes, they torment him. Show off, his mother screams. Cocky little bastard. Always was, his father yells. Orphans pour into the tent, and the player needs to fight them off while avoiding the gargantuan limbs of the deceased Graysons, as Dick begs them to stop. It wasn't his fault, it was Zuko. It was all Zuko. Once the orphans are down, a light emerges at the top of the tent. The player is prompted to grapple up, but are snatched in midair by John and Mary, and cast back down. Dick Grayson falls through swirling darkness into a more primitive bat cave. It's sparse, lifeless, and cold. Batman stands alone, silhouetted by the bat computer. Dick runs up to him, asking for help. He reaches out to grab him, but his hand touches a mirror. Looking down, he sees himself in the bat suit. The words, I want to be just like you, echo throughout the cave. The player takes control of this Grayson Batman as a swarm of robins descend from the roof of the cave, dressed in the version of his costume from Arkham Bonds. Although Dick's in the Batsuit, he still controls like Robin with the same moveset and gadgets. During this section, Mother's voice can be heard. She says she once found an orphan from Gotham, not much older than Dick is now. As a child, his parents were gunned down by police. The trauma consumed him. By the time he found her, he had been forged into something strong. The same strength that Mother has, that Batman has, that Robin lacks because Batman let him down. No matter how many Robins the player defeats, they are eventually overwhelmed and buried by them, once again swallowed up by darkness. Until a light goes on. It's Bruce wearing spelunking gear with a helmet light. He tells Dick it's safe to follow him and the player takes control of a 15-year-old Dick Grayson in his own spelunking gear and follows Bruce through the darkness. He speaks about the history of the manor. He tells Dick about how intimidating the grounds were for him as a boy. He rarely left the house, having to be forced to play outside by Alfred and his parents. Until one day, his father decided it was time to get Bruce acquainted with all the nooks and crannies of the grounds. His father was clever. 
he made a simple tour of the property out to be an adventure like the ones Bruce loved to watch on TV. Each weekend, his father would pretend they were pirates or masked heroes and take Bruce out to a previously unknown portion of the property until eventually Bruce knew it all by heart. He was no longer intimidated, he felt as if his home had grown. Bruce leads the player out onto an overhang, looking down into the depths of an empty cave. Here we are, a part of the grounds that even my father never got to see. An expansion for the Batcave? Dick asks. You know something? There's no one else I'd rather be with on this adventure. A light suddenly breaks through the upper crust of the cave. No, you will submit! Mother's voice rings out, and the overhang crumbles, sending Dick Grayson tumbling through the darkness once again. He emerges from the shadows as Robin on the outskirts of the circus ring beside Tony Zuko as he is cutting the trapeze wire. The player tries to attack Zuko, but he is like a ghost, unable to stop the event that caused his parents' death. No, it won't be like last time. The player climbs to the top of the trapeze as the Graysons soar above them. Once the player reaches the top, the lines snap and they begin to fall. The player is prompted to catch the Graysons by using Robin's grappling hook, and they swing down to catch them. On the ground, Robin tells his parents that he never got to say goodbye, that he knows this isn't real, but if he's cursed to relive this memory for the rest of his life, just one time, he wanted to say thank you and hug them goodbye. His parents turn to skeletons in his arms, but he doesn't care. He embraces them with all he can. Once again, a light emerges at the top of the big tent. This time, it spreads rapidly until all is consumed in a wave of pure white. Robin comes to consciousness on the hospital rooftop. A helicopter is swirling before him, stuffed with unconverted, kidnapped children. He has Mother in his grasp, who is desperately trying to pull away from him, saying this is all wrong. He couldn't have overcome the trauma. He's weak. Batman made him weak and Robin makes Batman weak. He holds her steady and says, You never understood Batman and Robin, then headbutts her. She collapses to the ground, mumbling to herself that this must have been a setup. Crane must have betrayed her, or Ivy, or Prometheus. Robin rushes over to the helicopter and pulls the pilot out, then begins prying the doors open. Mother is half delirious, asking herself where her son got off to, before tripping over the edge of the building. She screams until she no longer can. The free children rush over to the ledge, but Robin steps between them, saying there are some things they're better off not seeing. Come on, let's get you all some hot cocoa. Cut back to Batman one last time. The player picks up right where we left off, staring at the broken bat signal up in the sky. It's time to travel to it, but it's not coming from the GCPD headquarters. No. It's coming from the Lady of Gotham statue in the middle of Gotham Harbor. The player travels to the source, on top of the Lady's Eagle, where Prometheus stands beside the signal. He's cocky, and thanks Batman for taking the time out of his busy schedule. He asks how his back is doing. Give yourself up. Batman steps to Prometheus, but he holds up a detonator switch. Uh uh uh, before we end this little dance, I just want to know one thing. What did you hope to accomplish? that you're held responsible for your cruelty. Right, right. I don't mean the hero shtick. I've seen the classics. I get it. But you, the man under the mask, what's the mark you want to leave on Gotham? There's no difference. Well, that's not the Gotham I know. Prometheus pushes the detonator. Explosives planted along the Lady of Gotham explode. It's time for the final boss battle atop this slowly collapsing statue. Batman and Prometheus are pulling out all the stops on this one. The player is faced with all of Prometheus's moves, which include his nightstick, various projectiles from his gauntlets, as well as a few tricks he's picked up from watching Batman and his protégés over the last few days. All the while, Prometheus proclaims his hatred for Batman and everything he stands for. He is going to remind Gotham of a time before Batman by destroying its symbols of justice. That arrogant signal, the Lady of Gotham, and the Batman all in one stroke, delivering a death knell for hope in Gotham City, reminding everyone how easily paragons of justice can be broken. The first round ends when the Lady of Gotham's arm is blown off, sending the two combatants down onto the side of her collapsed torso. 
The battle continues as the statue slowly begins to sink into the harbor. Prometheus is giddy. He'd much rather be rescuing his hometown from the grip of a narcissistic self-proclaimed hero than be attached to Mother's hip any longer. He asks Batman if he wants to know the true reason she betrayed the League of Assassins. It wasn't some power play. The deal with Hive came out of desperation. It was because she learned the League orchestrated the slaughter of her village. He only learned the truth himself recently, but it shattered him. She didn't live up to the idealized version he had in his head. She was weak, emotional, and he had outgrown her. After the player finally gets Prometheus's health low enough, a quick time event will trigger where Batman, using the enhancements of his armor, absolutely thrashes him. I mean a real, one-sided, complete and total ass-kicking that shatters Prometheus's nightstick and destroys his gauntlets, resulting in the villain being thrown from the statue into the rubble below. Batman's shadow looms over him. Ooh, very scary, he says, getting to his feet. He'll give one thing to Mother. She was always right about people, and she was right about him. Batman's no more than a strong facade hiding a fragile child. That armor is proof enough. Good thing I've never had any problem putting children in their place. I'm not hiding. Batman casts aside his armor. I'm right here. He makes himself vulnerable, stripping off anything that isn't necessary to his continuing motor functions, because let's remember, this guy is seriously messed up. He goes fully shirtless, burly chested Batman mode. It's as a man with a beating heart that he will fight Prometheus, not as an unfeeling machine. The last round of the fight goes down. It's not as quick paced and bombastic as the previous two. It's a bare knuckle brawl between two injured titans in the ruins of a fallen colossus. But the strikes are brutal. The impact is felt from every punch, every counter, until it's finally over. Prometheus goes down, and Batman stands victorious, bloodied and beaten, but not broken. Robin comes gliding over to the island and lands beside Batman. The Dark Knight smiles and collapses from exhaustion, but is caught by Robin. The dynamic duo don't say anything, although their stare conveys a bittersweet understanding. Prometheus has been made into a whimpering, pathetic thing. He shouts that he's Gotham's true son as he pulls a hidden throwing knife from his boot, but his wrist is caught from behind. He turns and locks eyes with Batgirl. A realization of what's to come dawns on his face right before Batgirl beats Prometheus relentlessly, a la Joker at the end of Origins, shattering his helmet and knocking his ass out. The day is saved. Sirens blare in the background, and the three heroes stand united in their shared victory. Now we're about to get to the epilogue, but I just want to make it clear that this wouldn't play until the player has completed every side mission in the game, similar to the Nightfall Protocols from Arkham Knight. We cut to a week later outside Wayne Manor. Dick Grayson finishes packing up his car with all his belongings. He kisses Barbara goodbye, hugs Alfred, then walks over to Bruce, who stands under the shadow of the manor on one crutch. Dick extends his hand out. Thank you. Bruce shakes it. Good luck on your next adventure. They linger there for a moment, half in the shadow, half in the light. Dick smiles and trots to the car. He waves goodbye to everyone and drives off into the horizon. Alfred and Barbara help Bruce inside. Ace waits in the driveway, staring after Dick. He whines, then follows the others inside. The next few scenes play out in a sort of montage. Commissioner Gordon and Barbara are at Harvey Bullock's funeral. Bullock's wife and teenage son stand beside a large photograph of the detective as his casket is lowered into the ground. All the inmates are being returned to Arkham, including Prometheus, under the supervision of Warden Sharp. Dick works alone in his dorm room, completing schoolwork. In the cave, Alfred dusts the costume displays. Batman and Batgirls are lit and clean. Robin's is dark but occupied. Alfred sees his reflection in the case, then looks back out at the Batcave to see it has darkened since the beginning of the game. Some warmth has faded. Batgirl kicks Penguin's ass in the middle of the Iceberg Lounge. Ivy is incarcerated in her new, custom-made containment chamber in the freshly constructed Arkham Asylum Penitentiary. A close-up shot of Dick Grayson's face as he dons a blue domino mask. Batman, 
perched atop a gargoyle, surveys the area around Crime Alley. He drops down to find a hooded boy stealing tires off the Batmobile. The kid sees Batman and frantically runs away. In the process, something flies out of his pocket. A close-up shot of the ground reveals it is Robin's shuriken. Batman's hand reaches down and picks it up. The end. And that's Batman Arkham Unleashed, the last game in my imagined Origins trilogy. Please let me know what you think in the comments. And if you have any spare time, I'd like to let you know what I think. This was a really tough script for me to write, even though I've had a rough idea for it since I finished Arkham Bonds. In fact, Mother was a villain I cut from the side missions video because I thought she had potential to be a bigger threat in another game. With all that said, honestly, I don't know how I feel about this one. I've been heads down on this project for so long, I can't tell if it's any good. There are parts that I really like, and there are other parts that I feel like I couldn't quite crack, but needed to compromise on for the sake of just getting this off my plate. This is by far the most time I've ever spent on a video, and probably ever will again. It was a gargantuan task that I'm happy I took on, but I'm even happier to be done with. The story I really wanted to tell with both of my games was the rise and fall of Dick Grayson as Robin. I think those are such pivotal moments in the origins of Batman, and Dick's departure marks the end of an era. I toyed around with having Jason Todd more involved in the plot, but I didn't want to overdo it. I also had a bit more drama planned out for the Dick and Babs relationship, but to be honest, I just couldn't find anywhere to make it work. On the flip side, I really wanted to pull out all the stops with this game. I wanted to include Prometheus since he's got a lot of hype in the Arkham community, I wanted to follow up on the Ivy plotline from Bonds and show her as a serious threat to the city, and I wanted to utilize Mother, who is a lesser known, more recent addition to the Batman mythology, because I feel she works thematically with the Batman-Robin relationship. Then of course, there was the Arkham Jailbreak. That felt like the only logical way to create a citywide threat from the get-go while playing into the ongoing narrative of the establishment of the Arkham we know from the first game. My biggest regret in the script is all the content I had to cut and repurpose that focused solely on escapees because it didn't really add anything to the actual story and worked better as side content. I also wanted to work in some connective tissue to the original Origins game, which is where the idea to introduce Talia al Ghul into Batman's life for the first time came from. Then of course, there's the breaking of the bat. What always bothered me about Bane in this franchise was the implication that something like Nightfall happened, but we only got teased evocative imagery without any follow through in Origins. Bane says he broke the bat in Asylum, and I guess it was up to me to write how it happened. I know people will comment that this isn't a Batman game, it's a Robin game, or it's a Batgirl game. It's technically a Bat Family game, but you know, that's part of the character and lore. By breaking Batman, that allowed me to shift the spotlight onto Robin and Batgirl, and I think that was some of the more fun stuff in the script. Plus, it allows for the dawning of some insane bat armor, which I think is also a really fun idea I would have loved to experience in a game. I don't know, maybe the script was good? I don't think it was bad? I guess my worry is that it's just mediocre. Welp, I've wasted enough of your time. If you've watched this whole thing, that's truly insane and I'm flattered that you'd give me so much of your time. Despite all my off-putting whining for the last two minutes, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching this, and please take care.